for zooming in with us and uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, to, for introductions, I'm Robert Theobald. I'm a small business ombudsman and vice president of small business services at the Arizona Commerce Authority. And we are doing this workshop in conjunction with a number of partners. One is the Phoenix Business Journal. So I'm gonna introduce Ray Shea and let him say a few words and then I'll jump back in. Hey, good morning, everyone. First, uh, everyone should really give themselves a pat on the back for being here, you know, having the interest to learn more about, uh, you know, how to start a small business, how to keep your small business going. We have some great partners and sponsors here this morning, too, the presenters. Uh, as Robert mentioned, this is the fourth. We've had one each quarter over the past, uh, uh, through about 2022, and we hope to continue this in, in the year ahead, too. Uh, but really, uh, appreciate your presence here this morning, too, as well as online. I think you're going to learn a lot. You know, take away as much as you can and, um, you know, certainly use the services available. I mean, all of these presenters are more than willing to have follow-up conversations with you, as well as uh, the Arizona Commerce Authority, who's a great partner of the Business Journal. So on behalf of the Business Journal, thank you for being here and, uh, and you know, wish you well in all of your future efforts in, in either starting a small business or continuing your small business, too. So wish you the best. And I'll let Robert introduce all of the presenters here this morning. Take care. All right, thank you. Just some quick housekeeping items. Um, please ask questions. We have some microphones. We'll take around if, if you have questions during the presentations. Um, we just didn't set them out, so there's you know get confused on hitting the button or not hitting the button and what to do. And, and then also, if you have to get up and use the restroom, get up, use it whenever. It's just right out across the hallway when you go out uh, through the, the front of here. Um, so those are some key things. There is some breakfast if you didn't get some coffee or bagels or fruit over there. Um, so make sure it's working. Oh, no. Gotta make sure the clicker is working for the presenter too. Oh. We will work with that. However, they flip through. So we have some great workshop partners uh, with us today. As you can see, we have the Phoenix Business Journal, Wells Fargo, the SBDC, REDW, and Gallagher and Kennedy. Um, just a quick, our condolences go out to the folks at Gallagher and Kennedy. They lost a very special person in their organization this past week. Um, if you didn't see on the news, one of their founders passed away. Uh, so our condolences to them. And we're grateful to have them here with us this week. Um, so we're going to have, you know, go to the next slide here. We got uh, just a quick note. Most of you came probably saw information about the workshop through the boot camp. But if you haven't attended the small business boot camp, again, every Tuesday morning, 9 a.m., we do a webinar to help support small businesses. Um, there's a content library and other stuff. It's a great program. So uh, feel free to join us. Um, and we'll look at the agenda here. Oh, too far. <laughs> All right, so here's the, here's the agenda. Uh, we're gonna have some bookkeeping stuff from uh, Cheryl Folkerth from REDW. Then we'll go into with Tim Maxey from Wells Fargo, uh, Matthew Engel uh, from Gallagher and Kennedy. And then we'll take a break. We'll jump into Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. You might be wondering, if we're talking about access to capital, why, why do we have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona with us? Um, because if you're looking to grow and expand your business, benefits are something you need to be talking about. So they're going to share some information on that. So it's something to think about. Um, and then we're going to have Nancy Sanders from the SPDC share some great information with us. Um, we have them wrapping up because they're a resource that everybody needs to know about. And I think everybody that's here in this room and online should be working with them. Uh, or their team around the state. And then we'll have some time for question and answers and then we'll wrap up. So we're real excited about today. Uh, again, one of the focuses for this session, if you've been to the other ones, is we're looking more at year end and what to do if you're planning on growing in 2023. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that come with year end with taxes and accounting and so forth. So we're real excited to talk about that and, and talk about our 2023 plans. 
So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Cheryl and let her uh, get started. I'm going to pull up your slide deck here. Oh no, don't look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, okay. That on, and they should be able to hear you right there. And so then I advance. I might have to do it. Then. Oh, okay. And my clicker has decided not to work. All right. So you can go ahead and advance to the first one. Uh, I'm excited to share with you today that bookkeeping is awesome. Yay. <laughs> oh, it's an essential function in your business for both legal and financial management purposes. We have assisted clients through most types of financial reporting and investment transactions other than going public. So I'm gonna share our perspective today. There are five things I think you should know or you should do immediately, whatever stage the company, whatever stage your company is in. And that um, is forming relationships, with sources of capital, having a clear, detailed financial plan, staying current on your industry trends, maintain accurate, timely financials, and build an advisory board. And so let's go into a little bit more detail. Go ahead and advance. Okay, so the essentials. Bookkeeping is the art of recording and reporting on the results of your operations. It should provide you with detailed records of your assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, expenses, and cash flows. Basic financial statements include uh, a balance sheet, which provides you an overview of the company's assets, liabilities, and shareholders' equity, showing how much money a company would lose or retain after selling all assets and paying off all debts. An income statement shows the amount of sales, expenses, and profit flowing through a business over a period of time. This statement is sometimes called the profit and loss statement or P&L for short. It culminates in the bottom line, which shows a company's profitability or net income after all costs are accounted for. And the final essential statement is a cash flow statement. So usually your profit and loss is going to be on an accrual basis, which means you've recognized accounts receivable, things that you have billed but not yet collected, and accounts payable, things that you owe but have not yet paid. So the cash flow statement kind of twists that back so that you can see where you are on a cash basis. Um, it's a detailed measurement of cash inflows and outflows to determine if a company is generating enough revenue to cover its debts, expenses, and investments. Go ahead. So um, the cash flow is the number one struggle that small businesses have on a day-to-day -day basis. Paying attention to the importance of bookkeeping can help mitigate that challenge by keeping close track excuse me, keeping close track of cash moving in and out of your business. There are many different models for man managing cash flow, 
when you're starting out, an Excel spreadsheet with the basics, basics is a very good place to start. Um, accurate bookkeeping provides you with the information you need to plot when you need the cash, when you expect to collect the cash, and when you need to be ready to um, provide outsourced resources to uh, keep your cash flow where you need it. So, you know, if you're thinking about it, you, your, your profit and loss statement shows you your revenue and expenses, but you still have to deal with the amount of debt that you have to pay. You have to be able to source that. It works. Okay. Oh, that's okay. I can advance my own slides. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so to just a little recap here. So the essentials are to be able to record, report, and budget. And I don't think I said enough about budget when we went through that originally. Um, so it's important as you're doing your accounting every month is you, you recorded what you actually received and what you paid. And you should be doing a budget that says, hey, this is what I expected to collect and, and pay, but, and then compare the two so that you're constantly analyzing your estimates and so that you're better at predicting where your business is gonna go in the future. It's an essential piece of operating a small business or a medium-sized business or a large business that you know where your shortfalls are gonna come. And that's what the budget does for you. <clears throat> and the cash flow. So the cash flow, um, normally you would be able to predict up to 13 weeks. That's a good, a good model to use to get to um, where you need to see. So, if you can look out six weeks and say, hey, that's a payroll week, I don't have enough cash, let me push this customer to pay their bill the week before, or perhaps I need to be ready to pull on my line of credit. Do not use credit cards if you can absolutely help it. <laughs> that is the, the last place you should go to try to fund your business. Okay. All right, so the other way that accounting or good bookkeeping helps you is in, tax preparation. Um, having complete and accurate bookkeeping smooths the process of pre preparing mandatory tax reporting. And it's not just income tax, it's also sales tax or gross receipts tax if you happen to be in New Mexico or any other kind of tax you have to, to um, collect and report. If your bookkeeping isn't clear and easy to follow, then you are gonna have struggle with getting those reports done on a timely basis. Um, payroll reporting uh, is, re you know, payroll reporting, you need to have good records for that too. Uh, often, we usually recommend that you outsource that and not try to do payroll yourself. There's too many rules, too many ways to get tripped up. Um, and the consequences are for not doing it properly are expensive. You know, those penalties can be 100% or more of whatever you didn't pay timely, which is just ugly. <laughs> no one wants that to happen to you. Um, and accurate records support better and faster tax preparation. And finally, um, having good records gives your CPA or whoever you're using for tax preparation the opportunity to consult with you on what is available for you to take advantage of, such as an R&D credit or other credits that are available because they're not spending time getting your books cleaned up. They're able to look at your books and say, hey, these are good. Now let's talk about the things that we can do. Um, you know, Do you want to accelerate income into this year if you're reporting your income on a cash basis? Uh, or do you wanna defer income? Um, do you wanna pay expenses early, defer expenses? I mean, it just gives you that opportunity to uh, plan better and take advantage of whatever else is out there if your books are in good shape. The next piece of why bookkeeping matters is, um, is to do business analysis. So you have better decision-making. Now I mentioned before about doing a budget comparing your budget to your actual results. And the other thing to do is to have, um, and what we do for all of our clients when we're doing the accounting for them is a, a month over month analysis and a year over year analysis. So if I'm doing, if I'm reviewing the accounting for the end of the month and I'm looking at a client's stuff, I'm looking at the trend, you know, you know, have utilities gone way up? Why did that happen? Is revenue way down for this customer or that customer? What's going on with that? And then we discuss that so that you can hopefully 
find triggers or issues before they become a bigger problem. Um, and then also it helps uh, if you're looking at the division 14 is doing really well, but division two is not. So then you can discuss that with your client also, or you can be aware of that and nip a problem in a bud in the bud. Um, I have a I have a golf course client and we could see that their water bills were going up. <laughs> it's like it was simple enough, but it turned out they had a, a, a leakage issue. So we were able to help them figure that out by looking at their account. Surprise, you know, it's like it is useful to compare those things monthly. So the other thing that um, having uh, better decision making and planning is that you can um, use this information to determine when you're going to get capital. Now, I mentioned that you're looking at the cash flow statement or you're projecting your cash and you're saying, hey, in six months, I'm going to need uh, an infusion of cash because I want to buy a piece of equipment. Well, you're not going to wait until that six months to get with a lending institution such as Wells Fargo to get a loan. You're going to start that process three, four, five, six months in advance so that you're ready to go when you need it. Um, and having good records gives the bank confidence in what you're telling you, what you're telling them, sorry, in order to get the loan so that consistent results, consistently good accounting provides you with that stability that you need to get lending. There are lots of systems that can help you with your accounting. Um, we have a lot of clients that use QuickBooks Online, Sage Intact, we use um, other services like bill.com, which has changed their name to bill, um, Expensify, Fathom, Dex, there's all kinds of things out there to help you with your accounting so that you're not doing the manual entry. Um, QuickBooks Online, you know, pulls the bank information down into your system and then it automatically, if you set up the rules right, codes things for you. So you're not wasting your time doing that stuff. The trick is to automate as many of the accounting functions as you can. Um, usually those systems come with no long-term contract, so you can pay monthly, and if you don't like it, you can step out of it. Um, they provide supreme uptime and security and are available 24-7. So the nice thing about something like QuickBooks Online, not that I'm making a shameless plug for them, it's just something I'm familiar with. Uh, I can get into the system, you can get into the system, we can look at it together and say, you know, let's look at this trend and we can drill down on numbers and say, what makes up this number and why did you pay this bill here and, and why didn't you pay this one and, you know, have a conversation about what's going on in your business and it, it's very useful. And usually they're directly integrated with one another for overnight syncs, they sync information nightly and have real time collaboration. Okay. And then finally, let's talk about resources a little bit. You should have a team of business advisors, um, you know, such as a CPA, an attorney, a banker, insurance, um, and health insurance agent or a broker to help you with your business. There is so much to know, you can't possibly know all the details. Um, it's important that you surround yourself with good professionals that will help you make the decisions that you need to make to uh, maintain your business and help your business grow. Um, and the other thing is, <clears throat> you know, one of the analysis tools you should use is key performance indicators. Now, I, was, I always like to poke around and see what's the latest trend. You know, the, the, the big five are revenue growth, revenue per client, profit margin, client retention rate, and client satisfaction. But I found some articles, it's just crazy, 170 key performance indicators. Who could possibly keep track of those? You really just want to focus on, I don't know, three to five. If you get more than five, your brain's going to explode. So, and, and you want to make sure that your bookkeeping is good so that you can funnel that information into your, uh, to a dashboard of some kind so that you can look at those key performance indicators on a regular basis. So we have a golf course client. One of the things we help them do is like, how many rounds did you play this month last year or the year before compared to this year? Um, how much money are you spending on water? You know, fertilizer, all those things so that they have a good 
um, feel for the consistency of their business, how they're growing. You know, golf courses are one of the businesses that did really well during COVID, which was interesting, but people wanted to be outside. So they're out playing golf. And, and really the golf trend was kind of going down until COVID. And now it's kind of gone back up the other way um, because people had time to play 18 holes. Now we'll see what happens now that we're all back working more <laughs> back in the office. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So, so I'll just reiterate the five reasons why um, bookkeeping matters. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about year end. Um, it enables you to monitor the health of your business, keeps close track of cash moving in and out of your business, provides smoother tax preparation and planning process, data analysis fuels growth strategy and planning, and it helps you build and rely upon business advisor relationships. So those are the, the things that I wanted to mention again. Um, so for the year end, uh, oh, let me push the button again. Here are like eight things I suggest you do. So prepare a closing schedule. And what I mean by that is, I know it's December 31st and you're, you're ready to close your year. And so it's gonna take you time to get all the pieces in place. So a closing schedule helps you say, so that you can keep yourself accountable and your staff accountable. I am gonna have accounts receivable figured out by the 15th of the month. And what that means is you've looked at your AR and said, oh yeah, so-and-so hasn't paid me and it's been six months. I probably won't collect all of that. Or, <clears throat> um, oh yes, I need to build this client because we finished their work at 1231. So it, you know, it's a process you should do every month is review your accounts receivable. Um, and so the closing schedule says, I'll have my AR done by December, uh, January 15th, my AP done by the 17th. Um, and then I'll also have looked at all of the other assets and liabilities I have on my bank, sorry, on my balance sheet and assess them, have support for those numbers. So you know where they came from um, by a certain date so that you could have your books hopefully closed um, some people do it by the 5th. Shocking, I know. Um, some people do it by the 20th or by the end of that month. Sometimes the, the year end takes a little bit longer than a nor normal month to close because you have additional work that you're doing. Um, gather your outstanding invoices and receipts. And when I say invoices and receipts, I'm talking about accounts payable. Make sure you've got all of the liabilities, all the things that you owe for this current year booked into this current year. Um, you don't want to... Um, put a bill for, I don't know, um, anything, uh, counting services in February, if they were for December, you wanna have that matching principle always when you're doing your accounting. Um, so make sure you have received all your normal invoices and you have recorded those properly. Uh, and that includes reviewing your accounts receivable schedule, like I mentioned. And the same thing with your accounts payable schedule. Um, is there anything that's really old? Are you really going to pay that? Is there an issue with that vendor? At the end of the year is the time to clean all that stuff up so you're not carrying that forward into 2023. And then you're going to review your asset accounts. For example, if you have inventory, is your, does your inventory schedule support the number you have on your balance sheet? Is an adjustment required? Um, it depends on how you track your inventory. It could be inside your accounting system. It could be outside. You know, is it an average cost? Is it lower cost or market? You know, all those things you have to consider to make sure that your inventory is properly adjusted. If you've got prepaid expenses, you know, review those to make sure that this is exciting. I can see you guys are really excited about prepaid expenses. <laughs> um, you have all your insurance booked properly, whatever other prepaid expenses you have. Like if you've got uh, an agreement for um, monthly services, you pay that all in advance. That should be amortized over the year, those kinds of things. Um, then you're going to reconcile all the transactions, bank accounts, uh, credit cards, make sure everything is accounted for. Then you're going to close out your accounts receivable and payable. Um, and then you're gonna go back and check your receivables one more time. Is there anything that we need to accrue? Uh, is there a deferred revenue account that needs adjustment? Sometimes that happens with like software companies where they have um, sold a contract for, they've sold the contract to a customer and they're gonna amortize that over 12 months. So review all those things. And additional accounts payable are the bonuses accrued for, vacation time adjusted, you know, all those really fun things to tweak. 
and then you're going to provide that information to your tax accountant. And then once you have this done, you can really start looking at 2023. What growth plans do you have in place? You can start plotting your budget. You know, that's something you should be doing in the fourth quarter of the year also is plotting your 2023 budget to see where you are and where you expect to be and start getting that information loaded into your accounting system so it's easy for you to look at those reports on a monthly basis. I think that is everything. Anybody have any questions? You have a question, raise your arm, we'll bring a mic over to you. But um, I was just asking about software. Yeah, well, I would say, you know, it, okay, the famous CPA answer is it depends. That's what we always say when you ask these kind of questions, because they would take a conversation to really understand what your needs are. Mm -hmm. But most people, a lot of people, small businesses step into QuickBooks Online. Zero is another possibility. That one's just as simple. Um, and um, has good reporting, especially if you're working internationally. I, I find a lot of companies that do international work work with zero. So those two are probably the easiest to step into. And we did a boot camp on um, accounting resources. I think Chris almost helped us do that. So if anybody has questions, feel free to email myself or Faith and we can find that, that boot camp for you because they talked about some of the low cost and no cost software out there so you can at least have something as you get started yeah uh, so even if you have to start with an excel spreadsheet just so you're doing something i mean i don't recommend that long term but something to help you look at your revenue and expenses on a monthly basis and where your where your assets are at any other questions oh we got an online question so online, we have the question posted, what should you look to pay on a monthly basis for a bookkeeper? I, I'm going to say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> and it really does depend because it depends on what you need them to do. You know, if, if you have a somebody that's like us that we come in and help you with your books, we're not necessarily doing every transaction. You might have someone do part of that and we do part of it. Um, if somebody's doing all the transactions, it, it, it really just depends on what your needs are. Does it cost more if you show up with a shoebox full of receipts and say, help yes. me? Yes, we do. We charge extra for shoeboxes. <laughs> if you scanned it and brought me a, you know, um, said, hey, I have this all loaded over here and it's already organized, that would cost less than a shoebox. Okay. <laughs> no other ones? All right. Well, let's all thank right. Cheryl for the presentation. Thank you. All right, next up is Tim. I'm gonna load up his uh, slide deck here. Good morning. Look at video of myself here for a second. <laughs> All right, well, I'm uh, Tim Maxey. I'm with Wells Fargo. I am a lead growth biz lead business growth strategy consultant. It's not on the screen, so I had to try to remember it, and that's a lot of words. Um, I've been with Wells Fargo about 17 years, and essentially what I do is I work with uh, regional leadership and our branch uh, banks to provide the best service advice and guidance to our business customers like you. And uh, part of my job is I get to come out and uh, present like this and share some ideas of how to help make your business be successful. So today we're going to be talking about access to capital, how you can build a relationship uh, with your bank and with your banker, and then some ideas around what to be thinking about uh, last couple months of the year. That was perfect timing. Right? <laughs> so the topics that we're going to be talking about, uh, managing credit, uh, what potential lenders are going to be looking for, business credit life cycle, making sense of the different financing options that we offer, and some free educational resources at the end. So first off, um, financing opportunities and credit. You'll see at the top of the screen, it says, don't guess about credit, manage it. Credit really should be viewed as a resource that you manage for your business. 
it can be um, vital to the success of your business to a, a business owner that really struggles with credit that may have a, a bad credit score they could have a hard time getting funding and as Cheryl just shared the importance of cash flow that is one of the number one priorities for most businesses we want to make sure that we can help with that so you want to know um, what's going on with your credit so how can you rely on credit it provides working capital supports business growth helps you take advantage of opportunities. Your banker can be a huge resource here by conducting a financial review, reviewing your, your current situation and discussing business goals. So one thing I would definitely recommend here is if you don't know who your banker is, wherever you bank, hopefully it's Wells Fargo, but if it's not, know your banker. So who helps your, your business? Do they know your business? Um, right now, you're probably thinking towards end of the year, what, what happened in this last year? What were some of the things I accomplished? What, are, I'm, what am I proud of? What do I wanna change? What do I wanna do for next year? What is my one-year plan? What's my three-year plan? I would share that with your banker. That's very important for us to know so we can really customize a plan to help you with your business and help you get uh, to achieve the goals that you're wanting to. <clears throat> so to take control of your credit profile, um, what that is, it's everything that the lender sees about you, um, a little bit more than just your credit score. Um, it starts, one, creating a sound financial footing. This is when you go into the, the bank and you're setting up your, your checking and savings accounts. So a lot of times you start off a business, maybe you're uh, running it out of your personal account and you're using some personal financing. At some point, you need to be able to open up those uh, business accounts. When you do that, that is your opportunity to meet your banker that you'll be working with, share uh, what your business does, what your goals are for the business. Great opportunity for you to start talking about financing too. Even if it's um, real simple, just a credit card. Um, maybe it's a small line of credit. You get like a $10,000 line of credit. It's crucial to your business to start getting financing early. So early on, that can help you to be able to um, help with seasonality in your business. Maybe you have some inventory you need to purchase. You can get rewards on a credit card for everyday purchases. As you build up your business credit later on, that's really gonna help you when you're starting to go for some of those larger, you know, $100,000 line or a million dollar loan, commercial equity loans. That's really gonna make a difference there. So we're gonna be looking um, at your credit, your payment history, how you've managed credit. So be keeping that top of mind, even from when you start off your business and also looking back on it. Bank strategically, um, this one's important too. If you make it too confusing, it's hard to keep track of. So Cheryl just did a nice job of walking through how do you wanna um, keep track of your finances and try to make it simple using some um, different uh, software possibly, but here, if you're spread out all over the place and you have 10 different bank accounts, 10 different banks, that could be very confusing. It might be hard to track your cash flow. Um, it's not a bad thing necessarily to have a couple different accounts, but I would say minimize that. Make sure you're being strategic with how you do your banking. Uh, be able to demonstrate a consistent flow of funds so we can tell what's going in and out of the, um, the account to show your cash flow. And as I mentioned, mentioned cultivating that relationship, I would recommend meeting with your banker about three times a year, um, possibly more if you have a lot going on, but I would say about three times is, is a good idea. All right, so getting to know your credit reporting, we're gonna look at both personal and business. So just about every uh, loan, line of credit, credit card that a bank does, we will look at a guarantor's credit, which is the typically business owner's credit and we're looking at the business's credit history, okay? Um, your credit report, we're looking at uh, information such as payment history, credit usage, your debt load, uh, making sure you don't have uh, too much out there, but you're managing credit effectively. We're looking at your credit scores, um, business and personal side too, just to give us an idea of, again, how have you managed your, your credit over time? Uh, what's your outstanding debt look like? This is the most basic thing. This is what we teach to all of our bankers to really understand. And this is good for all business owners to understand is what goes into credit. 
Um, we hear so many times that, oh, I have this credit score, so I should be good. But there's so much more to your, your credit than just that one score. So the five C's of credit, uh, number one, credit history. Uh, I mentioned a couple times already, but how you've handled your past credit obligations. Um, this is how you, it may indicate how we can expect that you pay us in the future. I've taught the same things to uh, like middle school students. And I usually bring a couple of them up here and I have one of them hand them a fake hundred dollar bill and say, all right, he's lending you this money. And let's say a couple of weeks from now, he comes back to you and says, hey, I can't pay you that back, but I'd like another hundred dollars. Are you going to give him that money? And the middle schooler is like, no, why would I give him more money? He didn't give me the money back. It's like the most simple way of like, if you pay it back, you can probably trust that you're going to pay back other things. If you don't, then maybe not. So your, your basic credit history there. Collateral, what do you have? as a source for repayment. So do you have a large piece of equipment, a uh, piece of property, um, a lot that we could be considering as far as um, collateral. Uh, if it's a restaurant, maybe you have, uh, we've used a walk-in freezer in the past, uh, maybe something that is, is worth, you know, some value that we could use there. Um, capital, this is um, what we call sometimes your skin in the game, um, personal investment into the business. So a lot of times you might put some cash in and you have it sitting in a savings account and you use that as your, your rainy day fund or in case of a big purchase, I'm just going to pull that cash out and I'm going to use that to make the purchase. So not necessarily a bad idea, but what could happen is if you take all that cash out, make that purchase, now you need something else, you're kind of strapped for cash, right? Um, we actually, as a bank, want to see, do you have that cash? Do you have some capital already set aside? Um, it shows that you've invested in your business, but in order for us to provide you maybe additional lending, we're going to look at that too. So before pulling your cash out and using that for a major purchase, I would consider, could I do a loan? Could I have a line of credit that I could utilize that for these big expenses and pay that off? Um, a lot of times you can even get rewards. It helps your, your business credit as well. Conditions. This is we're looking at everything else going on um, that impacts your business. We saw a big one recently with COVID that impacted a lot of people. We're seeing supply chain issues right now. Um, inflation. Uh, we're talking about potential recession. Some businesses are impacted more than other businesses. So we're going to be looking at your specific business and how do the conditions that are going on right now impact your business? And then your capacity to repay. Obviously, you have to make enough money to pay back what we're going to give you. So that's where all the documentation that Cheryl talked about is so important. If you come to us with a box of receipts, we're going to do the same thing like, uh, we could look at it, but it might take us a long time. So we would love to see well-organized documentation about your finances, your cash flow, accounts receivable, accounts payable. The more we can see the better we can understand your capacity to repay. So what we're looking for when you come to us and say, hey, Wells Fargo, we need, um, we need a loan, we need a line of credit. We wanna know what the purpose is. Um, believe it or not, that is really important for us. If you just say, I, I just need money, we may not be able to do it. But if you're saying, hey, I have a great opportunity to build a new building, or I have a great opportunity to expand into another market, but in order to do that, I need X amount of money. That makes sense to us. And then we can see, all right, how is that going to impact your finances? How is that going to impact your ability to repay? And we can start working on a plan to help you there. Um, again, we're going to want to know your credit history. Um, be as upfront and accurate as possible. Like I said, manage credit as a resource. But let the banker know if there's something that's in your credit history that's a hiccup, let us know. We might be able to overcome that and we'll give you some ideas and resources. Um, but it's good to know that up front before we um, really go into the, the process. Your company finances, we want to see the cash flow projections. We want to see um, all that paperwork that you've got, gotten from working with your accountant. Um, the more detailed, the better to help us out, um, get you approved for what you need. And then application details. Um, we're going to ask you a lot of questions. We're going to have you fill out an application. Any paperwork that a banker gives you, try to be as complete as possible in that. Fill it out neatly and accurately. Get it back timely. A lot of times, uh, 
lending that we're trying to do gets held up because we're waiting on, on documentation. So the quicker you get that, that back to your banker, the better. And again, be upfront and know your, your information. If you go to the banker and say, um, I need $100,000 and we say, okay, what's your annual revenue? And you're like, that's about a million. And we're like, okay. And then we take a look at the information and it's way less than a million, it's 500,000. Again, that's a, it's a potential issue and that's gonna affect, could we get this done? So the more you know about what's going on in your business and your finances, the better. Um, enhance your cash flow. So as you've been documenting and you're taking a look at what's going on with cash flow in your business, um, you wanna see, can you accelerate your inflows? Is there a way you can speed up invoices, having money coming in a little bit quicker? Could you be providing additional payment options to your customers to get money in quicker? So I would be challenging that to see how am I taking money in? Does it make sense or could I be changing some things? I would be challenging your costs right now. Track bills, uh, inventory, know your payroll obligations. A great time right now, end of the year, to be thinking about these things. I love the example earlier of the, the golf course finding out that they had a, a, a leak on the course and that might have been costing them a lot of money. When you have accurate records, you're going to identify a spike in one area that could save you a couple hundred dollars a month that could be crucial to the uh, success of your business. Uh, watch your outflows. You can manage that with credit that can help you with seasonality, um, that can help you to get rewards. Like I said, it can just help stay on top of things. Maybe you can take advantage of some trade discounts. So if you could pay off some inventory within 30 days and you get a couple percent discount on that, um, while you're waiting for the invoice to come in, that could be a way to save you a little bit of money too. So I'd be looking back right now through the past year to see, could I have saved money anywhere? And if so, how do I make that happen going into 2023? Um, cover your taxes. You also, that's another one for end of year. You don't want to get surprised coming up with a, a big tax bill that you weren't ready for. And now you come to the bank saying, hey, I need a loan to pay my taxes kind of a bad spot to be into. So if you can set some money aside every month, every quarter, I would definitely recommend that just to make sure you're prepared to pay the, the taxes that you need to. And as I mentioned, challenge everything. Look back at the, your financial statements and just see, am I getting value from relationships? Am I getting value from um, my vendors or um, anywhere I can maybe cut back on some expenses uh, and save some money? So we're gonna look at business credit life cycle. Um, there's five different stages of business from seed, seed to startup. I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, seed startup, this is where you're initially thinking about an idea, you're starting your business, you're probably using some of your business, uh, your personal finances. You might've borrowed some money from family. Um, this is where you're setting up your accounts. So typically what you wanna be thinking about as far as accessing capital, is there any business credit cards I could be getting, a business line of credit? Even if you start small, you wanna to talk to your banker about that. Um, <clears throat> for healthcare, if you're in the healthcare field, a lot of times banks, I know Wells Fargo does, we offer great financing for healthcare, healthcare startup as well. So we'll be talking about that. And then micro lenders, there's a lot of other lenders outside of the bank that can also provide um, access to capital at this stage. Hey, Tim, real quick on micro lenders, because you don't do micro loans, do you? We don't. No, we have some resources, but we don't do it. So, so we have Gabe here. Gabe, can you raise your hand? Gabe is with a, a lender, Prestamos, and they do micro loans. Um, so if that's in your needs, you can talk to Gabe while he's here. Oh, he's not absolutely. presenting today. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have to connect after. Um. The next stage is the growth phase. So um, after you started up, you might have seen a lot of growth. You're seeing success with the product that you're selling, maybe the software that you created. And this is where it's kind of that make it or break it stage. You might grow so much that you're just like, I don't know what to do and a business could fall apart. So this is where it's critical to have, have access to capital. Um, you get a giant order for the product that you just created. You wanna make sure that you could fulfill that. Being prepared ahead of time is huge. If you just come to the bank and say, hey, I've got this order I got to fulfill like yesterday, so I need access to $100,000, that's going to take time. It's probably going to take a few weeks potentially, and that could really hurt your chances of, of fulfilling the order. So if you can have 
you know, line of credit initiated kind of in that seed startup phase. And then when it comes to the growth phase, you, we can always increase the amount that you have. So what you want to be thinking about here is, do I have a business line of credit? Is it enough to help me to continue to grow? You might want to be looking at uh, SBA type loans or 7A, 504 loans, um, refinance purchase loans. You might be looking at commercial real estate. You might be thinking about, could I purchase a building instead of renting? Um, potentially looking at uh, real estate equity loans or lines of credit here too, if you already have um, the, the commercial equity and then healthcare financing right now too. Once you've, you've grown to a certain point, uh, businesses tend to hit the maturity stage. Um, this is where you really wanna make sure you have an edge over your competition and start thinking about how do I challenge things? How do I pay off um, some debt? How do I pay down loans? Could I refinance my, my commercial real estate, get a better rate, pay a little bit less, be able to put more money back into my business? Um, you may want to look at an equity line of credit and take advantage of the equity that you've built up in your, your real estate right now too. <laughs> then you may wanna look at um, the expansion phase. This is where a mature business kind of goes to the next level. You might wanna be looking at another uh, uh, market to get into. Maybe you own a restaurant and you're wanting to expand and build another restaurant. Um, you wanna go into another state, you wanna, um, go into maybe a couple different websites that you're, you're building or apps that you're, you're doing. So I would be thinking about here, additional real estate financing, um, going back to SBA lending, 7A504 loans, and any additional healthcare loans for that field. And then at some point, you're gonna to wanna to transition the business too. Um, so this is where you wanna make your business marketable if you're planning on selling it, or even if you're turning it over um, to you know, a family member or somebody else that's buying the business, um, you wanna pay down debt, you wanna refinance any um, loans that you have, make sure everything's in order, paperwork is looking good, just to kind of button it up and, and make it very presentable for somebody to potentially buy. Financing options that we offered, uh, most basic part of this, secured, unsecured financing. Um, secured means it's backed by collateral. Uh, on these ones, you can um, potentially get more money and you can get better rates. So this could be backed by cash, equipment, real estate, um, liens, et cetera. Um, can do personal and business here. Unsecured, this is no collateral. This is where you just come into the bank and say, hey, I need money. We're not going to secure it with anything. You're probably going to get a little bit less and you're going to have a slightly higher interest rate. Um, this is going to depend on your credit situation and your cash flow. So to find the financing that's right for you, your business, your situation, um, a lot of different areas you could go into one credit card. These are your everyday expenses. I would caution you from using the credit card for some of those large purchases. You might have a pretty big credit card, um, you know, $15,000, $20,000 line option, but you don't necessarily want to buy all your um, uh, equipment on there and max out the credit card. That could adversely impact your credit. Um, if that's all you got, you got to do what you got to do, but um, use that typically for your everyday purchases, your office expenses, your gas. Utilize it to get reward points too. Most credit cards have rewards. You can get some cash back, which can supplement cash flow. Lines of credit, these are gonna be typically bigger um, line amounts. You use this as a revolving source of funds. These are unsecured. You might wanna make a bigger purchase on here, um, pay it off. You might wanna use this for seasonality in your business. You might wanna take uh, advantage of a business opportunity where you might have to put in 20,000 that's where a line of credit is great. And as you pay it down, the line of credit's available again. So if you had a $50,000 line of credit, you use it, you pay it off, that 50,000 is still there. They're typically open for a certain amount of time. You might have a five-year one, you might have 10 years, you might have longer, it depends on the bank. Um, commercial real estate, this is where you're purchasing property. Um, a lot of times it might make more sense to purchase than rent. You might actually save a lot of money and you're building up some equity um, that can help later on with your business growth. SBA loans and lines, you'll probably hear a little bit about that um, later too, but uh, important to be thinking about what are some other types of uh, government guaranteed loans and lines that I could take advantage of. 
Um, there is a variety of different types and they have fixed or adjustable interest rates on these. And then healthcare financing too. A lot of banks offer, I know Wells Fargo does, um, we offer specific financing for the healthcare field that is very competitive too. You can also be thinking creatively about funding outside of the bank. There's seller financing, there's factoring, you have peer-to-peer -peer lending, mission-based lenders, and community development grants. Wells Fargo does have a resource where we can connect you um, with some mission-based lenders. I know uh, Arizona Commerce Authority has that as well, and I know we have some in the, the audience as well that would be happy to help. So some additional resources that we have. Um, I would encourage you after this, take a look at wellsfargo.com. There's a ton of free resources on there. We have free articles, um, information about credit, securing and using credit. Um, you can see on the screen, there's, there's info about cash flow, planning, marketing, uh, business insights. We even have some amazing women-owned business resources out there that have, if you're a women-owned business, we have some tools, resources, and groups that you can connect with to help your business. All of that is free. So with that, say thank you. Um, thank you for uh, being here and working towards growing your business and accessing capital. Appreciate it. All right. What questions do we have for Tim? I see Gabe's raising his hand. Let me get you the microphone. Great presentation. Thank you very much. I just had a quick question. Um, the healthcare financing loans um, is something new I hadn't heard of. I would love to learn a little bit more. Yeah, there, there's a lot we do with the healthcare financing. Um, we can do startups for practices. Um, we can even go up to... 100% uh, lending in certain situations on that. We can offer, um, we have advice and guidance that we can provide to, to doctors that are starting to practice. So not only do we lend money, but we're also helping you through the process mm -hmm. as, as you get started. We even have a site. If you're interested in buying a practice, we'll connect you and, and help you as you're, you're looking to buy. Real quick question. Is it, um, only, sorry, is it, uh, for like doctors, dentists, that, that kind of structure. What about um, like um, uh, home care, living, you know, uh, businesses along those lines? Yeah, great question. Typically home health care doesn't fall in that field. It is, you know, kind of around like the doctors, dentists, optometry, that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned um, getting to know your banker personally. So, I mean, does every like Wells Fargo branch, because my business does bank with Wells Fargo, have a business banker or, and how do you say, hey, I want to work with you and you alone? Because uh, that's something my score mentor just keeps hammering me for is like, you have to know your banker by name, yeah. but I don't know how to uh, approach that. Yeah, I love that question. And I love the advice of you have to know your banker by name. I think that's important. Um, most branches, at least at Wells Fargo, most branches have a business banker at the branch. If they don't, you could ask them, where is the nearest business banker? They could um, get you in contact. We also, depending on where your business is at, um, we also offer um, business banking, commercial banking. I got a couple of my um, friends here from Wells Fargo in the back that are in commercial banking. Um, so they would love to get to know you. But the, the more you can just talk to your bank and say, hey, I want to know a banker, they'll look at your specific situation, get you the right person. Hi, thank you so much. I actually have two questions for you <laughs> today. Um, first is a follow-up on the previous question. So I'm curious what questions or topics should be covered in a first meeting with a, a banker. So say we have a bank account, but like, for example, I did all of my processing online. I had no human interaction. So this is the first I've heard of having a banker. So what materials should we have? What questions should we be asking? And what topics should be covered in the first meeting? That's that's question one. And I'll yeah. hold for question two. Yeah, we'll start there. So <laughs> I, I love that question too. Um, and in our digital age, that happens a lot. You open your accounts online and you don't necessarily always see a person. So what I would recommend is go to your, your banker and be prepared with what are your priorities for your business? What do you want to accomplish? So um, maybe top priority, is it, is it credit? Is it cash flow? Um, is it, you know, want to put some money aside? You want to grow? So be thinking, what are those top priorities? What does my business need um, the most? 
also be thinking maybe like what's your one year, um, three year, five year type plans to what do you want to accomplish with, with your business? That'll really help us understand like what's important to you. What are things that are keeping you up at night and how can we help you get to where you want to be? And then we'll make a plan with you from there. Great. Thank you. And then, um, you talked about not using money from business savings to purchase items to build capital. So for example, I work in technology, like videography, media work. So what small items could I use to build capital to not take money out of savings? Um, Cause I don't want to prevent debt and I don't want to pay more interest on like loans or other things for, for equipment or other things that I need. So what would you recommend? It, it, I'll, I'll quote Cheryl here. It depends on <laughs> um, depends on what you're you're needing. Um, we went over some of the different types of lending that you can get. So you could potentially use the capital that you have in savings if it's like a small item and you're not like fully depleting that. Um, you want to make sure that you have a pretty solid cushion in cash though. Um, if it's a smaller, um, maybe it's a larger piece of software that just costs a little bit more than your normal, that might be like a credit card or maybe your line of credit. That's typically where you want to go. If you're looking for um, you know, bigger sources of capital, you're looking at maybe like a secured line of credit, like an equity line. Um, so that, that's something I would definitely bring up to your banker too, is these, this is where I spend my money. These are some of the equipment that I'm going to need as I expand into that one-year plan. I'm going to need this and it costs this amount of money. So we'll talk to you about what's the best type of loan, line of credit, whatever, to get that done. And much more money think about how that offsets that interest like is paying interest on that piece of equipment worthwhile because you'll be bringing it you know you'll be making you know x time on that purchase so i would i would kind of weigh all of those things too when thinking about that one thing that that happens that i that I've, i see and hear a lot is it goes with that question is the businesses will have that expense tim touched on this they'll have those expenses they'll spend their cash and they'll be like, oh, now I need a loan. And they can't get it because they don't have the cash. You need to get the loan when you don't need it. You need to get approved on that. And that's where your forecasting and using some of the service we're going to talk about later today can help. So, you know, hey, I'm looking at growing. I'm going to need a loan in May of 2023. I, I need to start working on that now. I don't need it now, but I need to get it lined out. Now I'm going to put a plug for one of our market lenders. Prestamos just renewed their relationship, um, their grant or their loan program with Maricopa County. So if you're a Maricopa County based business, um, this is a huge, huge positive. The 1% interest loan, small business loan that Maricopa County did with their CARES funding, their ARPA funding um, through Prestamos is going to be extended for another year. So if you don't need a loan, but you can get one for 1% and interest is what now? Six, seven, eight percent or more, you know, it's almost a, a no-brainer on that. It's a it's a really good option, really good deal for you right now. Um, and then lastly, knowing your bank or another question to ask, maybe does your bank loan to my type of business? Because some lenders don't, and it's not that they don't want to fund you, they just don't lend to that type of business. So you want to make sure you ask that. I just had a quick follow um, up in regards to your question. I think another thing to consider is as you're looking to acquire either equipment or any other purchases is really distinguishing between purchasing power and cash flow. And then just knowing, am I going to be able to cover this piece of equipment or purchase within the next 12 months? If so, then maybe leveraging a credit card or a line of credit would be a benefit to you. But if it's anything longer than that, you may want to look for long-term financing. So that's another thing that you should consider as you're thinking about acquiring things of that sort. I had a question about, um, I think we're going to talk about venture capital later, but venture debt. So if you brought in venture capital money and you talked about getting that loan before you need it again, is it good to get 
a loan or start looking at a loan right after you close a raise? Or what does that kind of look like with regards to getting that type of debt? Yeah, and I might, might see if these guys back here um, have some ideas too. I got my commercial bankers back here. But I would always say maybe if you don't need the, the loan right there, uh, if we're looking at like loan versus line of credit, line of credit's a great tool to use that you just have available for that future need. A loan you typically want to get when you're like ready to, to start paying towards that loan, right? You don't want to just get a loan and you're paying for it, but it's really not doing anything for your business. I don't know, uh, Florencio or Sarah, if you have any additional insight on that. If I understand it. Okay. Sorry. If I understand your question is, how do you transition from being a startup and leveraging lending there into borrowing from an institution? Is that, did I understand that right? Yeah, and kind of the line of credit, like, is it better to go and try and acquire that line of credit right after you close a raise? Or because I get with a loan, you immediately start having to take back that loan, but a line of credit is kind of money that you can tap into if you need it, but. Got it. Uh, and as my colleagues will probably, <laughs> well, this is a, a theme. It, it really depends on what you're really trying to do. Um, ultimately, right, if you're raising capital for your business and you're able to acquire what capital you need for that instance, it probably wouldn't be recommended for you to acquire additional debt to put your business in unless you really need to. But ultimately, as you make the transition, you definitely want to sit down again with a banker and share with them, hey, this is my plan. This is where I'm at. And would you would you think based on how much I've raised and where I want to go? And again, it depends on are you going to borrow to acquire something or do you need the line of credit just to have it? So having those conversations again with your banker will definitely help you. Uh, I think, again, the biggest theme is just communicate and communicate ahead of time. If you're thinking about this already, um, they can always send you to, to another specialist that we may have within the bank that may be able to speak more clearly on some of the things that you wanna know. And, and with the venture capital piece, and, and we'll let our, our, our legal experts maybe correct me on this, but if you take some venture money and you have a raise, there's gonna be management agreements involved and a lot, a lot of legal stuff in there. Um, so you may not be able to even do a loan at that point because of those agreements. Um, so you really need to make sure you have a lawyer involved before you do any raises with private funding. Mine is, um, I didn't know that it is probably a best practice to leave your money before, you know, you start searching, um, searching for financing and funding. So I'm a nonprofit and I had, you know, like everybody else, some money that was invested into the organization, but of course we used it. So now that I'm trying to find funding, it's like even lenders, Prestamos, uh, for instance, they don't just, they just don't assist. I'm not considered small because we're a nonprofit, but there's no way for us to, uh, I guess, utilize um, opportunities. Like I found section two to one D four, and then there's 202 and 811 through the government that are guaranteed financing options, but you need the lender and then the lender doesn't like want to deal with you. So I don't know how to approach it. So because I've, I bank with BMO, I tried to ask them and everybody just is unfamiliar. I don't get it. You know, they don't know what I'm talking about. And this is pertaining to like the guaranteed financing options, you know, especially for like a nonprofit. There's just no way for us to figure out, I guess, how to utilize them without a lender who, again, doesn't want to start with you because they're not sure. Like in-kind doesn't, in -kind doesn't count, you know, so we're, if we had a year where we've collected mostly in-kind, I've you know, attempted to go in with our projections and a project, but again, it just is flat. It's flat. It's like they don't, they don't trust it, I guess we can say, you know, but how do we navigate being able to utilize guaranteed financing, you know, with the lender, even a micro lender? Uh, 
um, in being with Prestamos, I don't know your particular case. If you have talked to somebody from Prestamos, so I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. But I would say that um, with nonprofits in kind, you're not um, able to, it's not a guarantee like uh, revenue that you'd get as a small business from customers. And over time, you get a, a track record and you get a history within kind. It's a lot more um, uh, up and down. So it, it, it uh, Prestamos in particular, because I'm working for Prestamos, I can talk about us, but we're uh, a lender and it, we're not, um, it's not grants, it's actual collateralized loans, you know, similar to what um, Tim's doing at, at Wells Fargo. So from, t sounds to me that um, in your case, and for nonprofits, look for grants. Look for things that. I'm saying, I, I, I know that our money comes from grants. We're talking, I'm talking about like in the instance of trying to, um, I guess, get working capital. Like I want to start a project, and I don't need, you know, I don't need. I, I have the resource for my project for later. It's going to be grants. That's like obvious, but like. Um, Hey, we want to get a bond return. We, I, I reached out to Press Almost to get even any amount, whether it was one dollar, five thousand, three hundred thousand. They still do not like trust your the way you would be, you know, just because of our type of business. So I'm trying to ask, like, how are we able to utilize for like a project? So if I want to do affordable housing and they have guaranteed financing for it. They don't take our projections off of in kind, which is the money and resources that we have been getting from grants, you know, because it's like one and the same, but they don't, again, it's like bankers, they just don't know how to prove for us to get us, get our gears going to utilize it and take advantage of it. It's just weird. So I would like to know how are we able to, um, I guess, start our banking relationship, you know, with who we bank with, because our bank, obviously, they got our money, they see our money, you know, but if I apply for a grant now, chances are I'm not going to be funded until, you know, maybe the fall or whatever a project is. So, again, utilizing things like guaranteed financing and stuff like that when, you know, our documentation is not necessarily the same, you know, like even I have collateral to use, but they're like, so, I don't know, it's almost like where did you get collateral from? Well, I mean, I bought it, I got it, like everybody else did. You know what I'm saying? But again, they, it's like they don't let you utilize it as a part of requirements and processing, you know, to get you in. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And that, yeah. it's tough with, with right. nonprofits, right? So grants are important and you can get a lot of money there. But if you need additional financing. Um, just like he was sharing, we do have to prove the income and we have to be able to see and we have to be able to see like those in kind, is that going to happen again next year? Right. Or do we take a percentage of that? Like, how would we calculate that? So that's where um, building that relationship with your banker and just letting them know this is what we got going on now. And this is what I want to accomplish. And your banker can share that, all right, based on how you're funding or how you're getting funds right now, maybe you could consider um, a, a couple different sources. Maybe you could do something that might be a little bit more regular than just the grants, and that might help you. Uh, we have at Wells Fargo, we have a resource, um, the Business Resource Navigator that I can share with you too, that will connect you with a, a large variety of CDFIs too. And when you put in there that you're a nonprofit, you put what you have going on, it'll connect you with all the CDFIs that deal specifically with what you have. I can't guarantee that they can do something, but that might be the right way to go just to kind of look at some different options too. So we have that, but yeah, get with me after I can give you that resource. And real quick, I'd, I'd love to chat with you afterwards as well. Um, Cause there might be some other resources that I can share with you outside of Prestamos. Also just a, a note when the SBA, for example, says it's an SBA guaranteed loan, it doesn't guarantee you will get a loan as a business. The guarantee is the SBA telling the lender, Hey, we'll back this loan. So you can maybe broaden your reach a little bit more on who you can lend to. Um, so more people can get into the loan. So um, there's, you know, as we talk about SSBCI that's coming up, the state small business credit initiative, there's a, a debt guarantee portion of that. It doesn't guarantee people will get loans. It guarantees the lender, you know, part of what the lender is loaning will get repaid if the loan defaults. And so 
Um, you know, sometimes there's just misunderstandings in that. It's also an important, goes back to making sure the lender you're talking to does loan on what you're wanting to get loaned on. Um, because that's a big piece of, you know, that lender may not do housing projects. They may not do these types of things, but they may know somebody that does, so you can always ask. These are great questions, so thank you. And we have time today, you know, to, to answer these. Hi, when it comes to building business credit, uh, two part question. One, if you get the line of credit, do you have to use, is there like a minimum amount that you have to use it in order for it to benefit your credit building? And also is the DUNS number critical or does it have any impact on building business credit? Yeah, I love those questions. So um, say it depends again, but on the, on the line of credit, having it will, will help your credit. It's good that you have access to that and we'll look at it. It helps even more when you use it and you're paying it back um, as agreed. You're paying it back on time. So we can see that you're utilizing your credit, right? And you're using that to grow your business. We can see how you're using it too. And that'll be part of how you tell the overall story of what's going on with your business and how it's helping your cash flow. So I would say having it's good, using it for your business is even better. Maxing it out and paying monthly would probably hurt you. Okay, so if you had like a $30,000 line of credit and you put $30,000 on it and you're paying $100 a month and that's, you know, for several months, it's just hanging out at a max balance, that'll probably be tough for you. So use it, use it effectively, pay on it, um, use it appropriately. Uh, the other thing as far as Dun & Bradstreet, a lot of startup businesses don't have anything listed with Dun & Bradstreet. We're going off personal credit only. So personal credit, very, very important. But as you start building credit, um, certain financial institutions will report to Dun & Bradstreet. We're absolutely looking at that. And uh, the more you can build up your business credit, the more it's going to help you in the future. So once we get you to, to people like Florencio and Sarah back here in commercial banking, they're going to be taking a look at, you know, the ins and outs of your, your business credit profile, your personal credit profile, and then all the finances that go with that too. So yeah, absolutely. Now, Is it done to know something that we should get right away? So, yeah, Sarah has some insight. I, I think, um, personally, this is my opinion. Do your, if your vendors are requiring a dunce number, if you're selling to, I believe Walmart requires a dunce number, then yeah, I think it's worth the investment. But if, if your vendors aren't requiring it and you're not and you're not requesting large amounts of I don't know. Am I doing this right? And, and you're not requesting like a, like we're not pulling Dun and Bradstreet reports on a line of credit under two hundred fifty thousand or two hundred or I think it's one hundred and fifty thousand. But if your vendors require that report, then that's definitely something to consider. I, if that makes sense. Would it be beneficial when you start your business, you go get your business bank account to get a very small limit, if or whatever limit you can get on a business? credit card that is just for that so it's not a personal credit card it's for the business even if it's a 500 dollars limit absolutely yes yeah. yep. sometimes that small thing could be the difference on the, the relationship with your bank is that oh you've had a business credit card with us for three years so yeah that might push you over the edge to get you the, re the reason i mentioned all the credit card is just a strategy with that is if you can get a small credit card even 500 dollars and you know, you have that cash to pay it off, buy it, pay it off. You know, it's, it's just a strategy for helping your credit. Unless you can get some points um, if it has points with it. But you can, you can slowly build your credit that way and show that, hey, I got credit and I pay it off. Over time, it should help with your, you know, your future loan needs. Absolutely. All right. Any other questions before we head on to our legal aspect? Awesome. Thank you, Tim. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right, we've got uh, Matthew Angle from Gallagher and Kennedy and why Matthew's coming up, I'm going to pull up his presentation. Good morning, everyone. So uh, while this is getting set up, uh, my name is Matt Engel. I'm an attorney at the law firm of Gallagher and Kennedy uh, based right here in Phoenix. Uh, we're a uh, full service law firm. We do everything from 
litigation, intellectual property, employment law, um, uh, all sorts of things. And of course, uh, business and corporate law, which is my specialty. Um, I'm a uh, corporate and securities attorney there. And my presentation is, is really called, So You Wanna Grow Your Business. It's more than just accessing venture funding because uh, accessing capital is part of growing your business, but certainly not the whole thing. And um, how do I move forward here? There, okay, there's, that's me a little bit. Um, so here's what I wanna talk about. And just so I know, in terms of who's here, how many of you are own a small business that's just sort of, you know, getting started relatively new and, and getting off the ground? Okay, a fair amount. Uh, and how many are thinking about forming a, a, forming a business, haven't quite done it yet, but are just in the, the planning stage? Nope, okay. And then everybody else sort of has a business up and running that's uh, somewhat mature, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with just some best practices for small businesses, uh, especially at the early stage. And this is really based on <clears throat> uh, things that I see relatively regularly when, when clients come to me and might be looking to raise money through uh, uh, equity financing or, or some other manner. And then we go back and look at, at the, their, their records for their company and see where they are. And we realize that it's, it's a lot, uh, there are a lot of things that need to be cleaned up because they weren't done right from the beginning. And it's a lot easier to get things right from the start than to go back a couple years later and try to clean it up. It's more expensive, it takes more time, and uh, it might spook uh, people who are thinking about investing in your company. So these are just some be uh, best practices at the uh, relatively early startup stage and, um, uh, um, and just as you're getting up and running. First of all, is structuring your company correctly from the start. And by that, I mean, uh, making it clear in terms of the, the founders of the company, what is the deal and who are the people involved? Who are all of the, uh, um, uh, uh, the various people who are gonna be owners of the business, employees of the business? And it's very important at the beginning to define the areas of responsibility uh, for who's gonna be doing what at your company. And I see oftentimes at the early stage of a business, uh, founders sort of taken everybody does everything approach, sort of all hands on deck, which is understandable, but, uh, but it can lead to problems down the road where, um, you know, once you're up and running a little bit, one person says, well, I'm the CEO. And the other guy says, well, I thought I was running the company. And, and, and I've seen this happen where it's a little fuzzy as far as who does what. So it's, it's important to define your roles early on and also who's getting paid for what, uh, if anything, at the early stage. Uh, so structure your company clearly from the beginning and complete your organizational documents properly from the start. Uh, most companies these days are either going to be a limited liability company, an LLC, uh, or a corporation. Those are by far the two most common uh, types of businesses, uh, although I know we have some, some nonprofits here in the audience as well. Um, so the organizational documents are your articles of organization or incorporation. Uh, operating agreement if you're an LLC, bylaws if you're a corporation, and, uh, and then some other agreements are typically found at the early stage, uh, a buy-sell agreement or a, a shareholder's agreement, which is really an agreement among the, the founders uh, to um, allow one founder to maybe buy out the other if certain things happen uh, or um, clarify some voting rights and things like that. Um, I do want to note for people who do have an LLC, the LLC laws here in Phoenix in Arizona changed relatively recently. There was a whole new LLC Act dra drafted that became effective in 2020. So, and it's, effect it's uh, applicable to all LLCs now. <clears throat> so if anybody had a company prior to say 2019, it was formed under the prior LLC Act, which is fine. But just note that laws have changed and it might be a good opportunity to sort of go back and just make sure that things still work the way you expect them to uh, with your operating agreement and so on. And then another thing that's important from the start is to maintain the minutes of your board meetings, your shareholder meetings, your member meetings uh, from the start. And this means anytime you have a, a meeting of the 
board of directors for your corporation, let's say, uh, take minutes, or if it's done through a, a written consent, not in an in-person meeting, have your consent signed and keep all these things. Because oftentimes I find that companies say, oh yeah, we've, we met you know, two years ago and we agreed on this, but it's not in writing anywhere. So it's hard to go back and, and, and see that. And again, investors are gonna wanna see the history of your business. Um, another important one that I see all the time is properly drafting and executing contracts uh, using the correct party names. If, if your company is named uh, ABC, uh, um, you know, Towing LLC, great, but make sure that your contract says ABC Towing and not just ABC LLC. Uh, so use the correct party names, make sure the contracts are clear in terms of the substance, uh, who's doing what, what is the length of the agreement, how long is it going to last, payment terms, obviously very important, who's getting paid for what, uh, and then some other common clauses you see will be indemnification or dispute resolution if there is a problem uh, down the road. And another thing that I do see all the time as well is don't sign agreements for your business in your individual capacity. So if you have ABC Towing LLC, I'm not going to sign that contract, Matt Engel. I, it's very important to say signed by ABC Towing LLC by Matt Engel as manager of the company. And so again, you wanna be sure that, that everything's documented properly using the proper signature block, specify what your title is if you're signing the agreement on behalf of your company. And, um, and then a question I sometimes get is, well, I have a board of directors, can the directors sign an agreement? Uh, again, the board of directors for a corporation, can the directors enter a, into a contract? And generally the answer is no, they really shouldn't unless they're specifically authorized only the officers of the company, the president, the CEO, those types of folks typically would sign an agreement for a, for a corporation. So those are some basics on agreements. Uh, another important thing at the early stage is to protect your intellectual property from the start. So this refers to uh, patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets as being the primary types of intellectual property. Um, if you're just starting a company, and the founders sort of have the idea in their head, they've got some great invention in their head and they say, I'm gonna start a business to, to develop this invention. Well, it's important to get that intellectual property out of the founder's head and into the, into the name of the company. And so the, 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 the inventor would sign an agreement, basically assigning the rights to that invention or the, the idea, whatever it may be, to the company. Uh, same thing with employees and independent contractors. Uh, make sure that when you hire people, they, it's clear that anything that they come up with uh, while um, engaged in business for the company will be assigned to the business. Um, and typically you see this in uh, a work for hire clause in language for a contractor that you might be hiring. Basically it says anything that they invent while they're employed by me uh, will be owned by my company. So again, getting these right from the start will help, uh, help you down the road. Uh, trade secrets, um, unlike other types of intellectual property, these are not uh, registered. Uh, you don't need to file to, to protect a trade secret. Uh, typical example is the formula for Coca-Cola. Uh, it's not a patent, it's not a copyright, it's just an idea that they take very strong steps to make sure nobody else learns. So the trade secrets are really up to you to keep confidential within your company. And you can do this through confidentiality agreements with third parties, um, uh, confidentiality provisions with your employees and contractors and things like that. Because once a trade secret gets out, it's kind of out there and there might not be anything you can do about it. So um, whereas patents, uh, you would go to a patent attorney if you have a physical invention that you think can be, can be patented. And, um, uh, and then with joint ventures and collaborative agreements, again, if you are doing a joint venture with another business, just make sure it's clear who owns what. If, if something is invented during that collaboration, um, who gets the rights to it or is it gonna be shared? Um, and since we're sort of talking about uh, venture funding and raising money at this, uh, at this presentation, remember securities laws. 
Um, basically, uh, there are um, securities laws are very complex, and I like to say that there are three types of securities. Uh, they're either registered with the SEC, they're either exempt from registration under a specific exemption with the SEC, or they're illegal. So it's important to, um, to get this right from the start. And basically, what is a security? Well, basically, if you're taking money from somebody else and they're, they're giving you money for you to uh, grow your business, odds are that's a security. Uh, typical exemptions are found under what's called Regulation D, um, private placement exemption. Uh, but basically, if you're thinking about raising money from anybody, uh, seek an attorney before you do it. Because even if you raise money from friends and family, uh, it likely is a security and you just want to make sure that you don't get tripped up in any way. Uh, and if you do, you, you know, there are, there are penalties and you might have to give the money back, among other things. Uh, and then also, since part of the focus of today is end of the year considerations, um, these are some things that typically are good to, good to do as the year comes to a close. And that is, take stock of where things stand. Did I, did I document my, my board meetings and my, my manager consents and so on? Um, preparing the financials, or the, the, we had the bookkeeping presentation earlier. Um, this is the time to start focusing on that. Double check, um, uh, do you have minutes and consents? Uh, any contracts that you entered into, are they coming up for renewal? Oftentimes, con oftentimes contracts uh, expire at the end of a year. Uh, it's a good opportunity just to take stock of, of um, you know, other deadlines that might, might come up. And, and a big one is, is your cap table up to date? Uh, that means capitalization table, uh, which is essentially your, your list of all of the stockholders of your company, who owns how many shares of stock. And I see it all the time where a client comes to us and we say, okay, who owns your, who owns your company? How many shares are out there and who owns how many? And it's a mess. And so it's important to know that if you are uh, taking money from somebody and you issue shares to them for that money, um, make sure that it's documented and make sure that your capitalization table is up to date. And is everything organized and findable? It's, 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 it doesn't help much if you have it all, but you're not sure where it all is. So, um, so those are some end of the year considerations. So, um, and that all ties into, as I said, uh, capital raising. Um, because if investors are going to uh, think about investing in your business uh, or a bank uh, loaning money to your business, well, they're gonna wanna see a lot of this documentation. And so, um, uh, so again, easier to get it right from the start than to have to go back and clean it up and potentially not get the investment that you were hoping to get. So please can I have some money. First things first, why are you raising capital? Um, it's important to know um, why you're looking for money. It's, you know, it's not just enough to say, oh, well, I, could, I can use some money. I'm, gonna, I'm sure something will come up. Um, what are your business goals? Um, what are the costs and uh, benefits of taking in a new investment? Um, how will the increased capital help you achieve your goals? And uh, do you have a plan for how you're gonna use those funds? Uh, and again, that's because investors or lenders are going to want to know what do you plan to use this money for. Um, and if you're thinking about equity financing, uh, meaning you're going to sell a stake in your company, uh, either selling stock if you have a, a corporation or selling a membership interest uh, if you have an LLC, uh, is now the, the right time to, to do that uh, because every time you you sell a stake in your business, uh, your ownership gets uh, diluted dilute, dilute a little bit. Uh, so just some basics here. There are essentially four types of capital sources. Um, first one is obviously capital from within. This is funding your business from your own personal money. And this is usually how things get started. Uh, there are pros to it. Uh, there's no dilution. You're not taking in additional owners. Uh, you control everything. Nothing has to be paid back, and um, if the uh, if it's you or the principals in your company, uh, people have uh, skin in the game. They might be more motivated to uh, work harder if it's their own money at stake uh, in the company. Um, some cons, obviously, there might be more limited amounts of money, um, unless you're Elon Musk, 
and there's uh, less diversification from a personal finance perspective, even if you are Elon Musk. Uh, if all your money is tied up in one basket, well, you know, there's a lot riding on that. Um, the other source, second source, would be capital from within, also, also called uh, bootstrapping. This is reinvesting the money that your company makes. And um, uh, again, some of the pros are you're not losing any control, you're not bringing in new investors, and um, you can manage the growth uh, as you, you, can, you expand and sort of in proportion to the money that you bring in, so you don't get in over your head. Uh, cons, it only works if you have cash flow, and it can be a little bit slower because um, you know, it builds up gradually. Third type is uh, debt, and here's where the bank loans come into play. <clears throat> uh, this is borrowing money from a lender. Uh, and again, there, there are pros to it. There's no dilution. Again, you're not selling an interest in your company. Um, no loss of voting control. Although oftentimes when you take money from a bank or another lender, there might be negative covenants, meaning there might be things that the loan documents prohibit you from doing uh, while you have the money. So maybe borrowing more money or, or, or any number of things. Um, uh, and, um, and potential return. If, you're, if your business plan works, you know, you haven't, uh, uh, you still have more of the ownership for yourself. Cons, um, funds have to be repaid with interest and priority of capital returns goes to the creditors first. So if uh, unfortunately your business, you know, goes under, uh, the banks and the lenders would be in line first to get repaid before any money comes back to you and the other owners of the company. And the last source, oh, come on, not sure if debt owns me or I own debt, is equity funding. And this is where you are raising money from outside sources, uh, basically other investors. Um, some pros, no defined payback period typically. Um, all the owners are at the same level, meaning that if you do need to uh, liquidate your business. Everybody uh, gets paid at the same time. There's not a priority for, for lenders. Um, and a potential strategic value, value from involving other investors. Uh, oftentimes other investors have expertise in the kind of business that you're running and um, can bring a lot to the table. Uh, cons, well, there's dilution. Uh, if you are bringing in new owners, and there's only 100% of the pie to go around. So the more slices there are, each, each slice gets a little bit thinner. And investors might want certain rights. Um, they might want a preferred stock that has some, some uh, payment priorities. They might want seats on your board. They might want um, sort of veto power over making certain major decisions, things like that. Uh, and then obviously investors might be needy or complain. Um, you never know. The more people who get involved, the more, the more people there are to keep happy. Uh, and then there's sort of a hybrid, which is convertible debt, starts off as a loan. And then upon certain events happening, it can turn into stock. So it's sort of a, um, a hybrid. And alternatively, uh, you could franchise your business. That's kind of a whole different, different topic. But if you have a company that's conducive to franchising, uh, that might be a way to... Um, expand your business, but not uh, have to take out a loan or bring in new investors. Uh, steps to prepare to raise capital through equity offerings. If you do decide that um, equity is your best choice, uh, some uh, questions to ask. Uh, where are you in the life cycle of your business? Um, are you at the startup stage, the uh, growing stage? Are you a mature company? And um, and so again, the type of equity that you take uh, might depend on, on where you are. And who are you talking to? Uh, friends and family, angel investors, typically that means high net worth individuals, just sort of private people who, who invest in small businesses and, and, um, and those kind of things. Uh, venture capital, more um, companies, funds that specifically invest in other in businesses. Uh, and then um, uh, private equity, family offices, larger companies, things like that. Uh, and, um, you know, potentially a, a public offering if, you're, if you get to a certain point and you want to raise money by selling stock to the public. Um, 
that's typically a little ways down the road and very complex, but obviously that's another way to do it. Um, important steps are to have your advisors in place before you start asking people for money. Um, your accountants, your tax advisors, your bankers, and your lawyers. Um, because again, securities laws are complicated and you need to get it right from the start. Some other questions. Um, if equity is the right choice, uh, do you know how much money you're asking for? Do you know what you need? Uh, do you have, a, any investor is gonna wanna see your uh, use of proceeds. What are you gonna use the money for? How long is it gonna last? Will it get you through a significant milestone of your company? Um, are you gonna come back in a year needing more money? Uh, you know, those types of things. So be sure that you are, that you know how much you need and that you ask for enough uh, so that you don't just get halfway to your, you know, buying that big piece of equipment or bringing that new invention to fruition uh, because getting halfway there isn't gonna help you much. You, you need to know if you need more, ask for it uh, upfront to get you to a certain milestone. Um, again, what form, um, what is your company worth? Uh, again, investors are going to invest in your business, uh, with a, uh, assuming a certain value to your company. And can you, do you have an idea of what your company is worth? And can you, uh, show how you get to that number? You can't just say, oh, I think it's worth about $5 million. Look at your financials. Do you have revenue that indicates you know, you, you can be valued at a certain multiple of your revenue, uh, things along those lines. Um, and, uh, and how much are you willing to give up? How much dilution are you willing to, um, to give? If your company is worth $5 million and somebody wants to invest two and a half million dollars in it, or you need, you're looking for two and a half million dollars, that's basically selling half of your company. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, your company would have be worth seven and a half million dollars. You have the initial five that you're worth plus the two and a half that you are taking in. Uh, and, uh, and each of the three owners, let's say they're just, you know, the, the new investor would get a third of your company. So you'd be giving up essentially one third of your business. Um, and not just you, but all of the existing owners would be giving up uh, part of their part of the company. And how much decision-making authority are you gonna be willing to give up as well? Are you going to uh, offer board seats? Are you going to offer other, um, uh, other benefits to the investor? And, uh, and so these are all considerations to think about before you go shopping your equity offering around um, because investors are gonna, wanna, are gonna wanna know what, they're, what the deal is. And here's a fellow who thinks he's making a very savvy deal. I receive unlimited working capital. You receive no voting rights and minimal equity. Sounds like a great deal. Uh, it doesn't happen all that often, but um, not sure how it worked out for him. Uh, so, um, uh, so again, investors are going to want to look under the hood. And so all the things that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation uh, come to play at this stage where they're going to kick the tires, look under the hood of your business, and see if everything's documented properly. Is it clear who the owners are? Is it clear what your capitalization table is? Because they, what they don't wanna do is invest a bunch of money walking into a problem, walking into a lawsuit, finding out that, oh, so-and-so you know, came out of the woodwork, said, oh no, I, I had 10% uh, of the company. The, the owner said, oh, you know, he'll give me 10% if I help him out with this. And, and then you've got a problem. Um, so again, is your structure in place, your entity formed properly, capitalization table clear, cleaned up, no side deals. Um, sometimes companies at the early stage will, will offer people options or warrants, uh, basically an option to buy shares in the company uh, down the road at a certain price. And, and are those documented? And do you have it clear as to who all those people are? Because again, an investor is not going to want to put in money and then find out that so-and-so says, oh, I have the right to buy a million shares of your company um, down the road. And, and it can come back and bite you as well, because as part of raising the money, you're going to be making certain representations about the status of your company. And if some of those things were untrue and there was somebody coming out of the woodwork saying, I have the right to buy 
you can be on the hook as well. So uh, is your business structure in place? Financials are prepared? Is your bookkeeping up to date? Uh, is everything understandable? Do you have a business plan? And is everything written? Uh, and, um, and again, is it understandable? And is the value proposition for investors clear and attractive? If you are gonna be raising money, um, typically you will have a, uh, a pitch deck or, what's, well, or PPM, private placement memo. It's basically, it's a document that lays out the history of your business, um, what's your great idea, what's the uh, you know, secret sauce that you have to your company that makes you better than everybody else, how much money are you looking for, who are the, um, who's your management team, who are the people running the company, and, uh, and what are you going to use the money for? Again, will it just get you to a certain milestone and you're going to need more money down the road? Will it get you to the point where your product is ready to be sold? Whatever it may be, there's really no, no right answer as long as it's clear. And, um, and then just, uh, again, a little, little recap here. If equity is your choice, um, have you engaged an attorney to ensure that you comply with the securities laws? Uh, and again, they're typically for small businesses, uh, seek out exemptions for having to register your stock, uh, register your offering under securities laws. Um, uh, and typically it means that you're, you're not offering your, your stock or your equity to the public. You're just doing very limited private individual placements. You're not marketing it to the public at large. Um, and, um, uh, uh, but again, you want to make sure that you do qualify for an exemption, uh, before you get started, you might uh, inadvertently, uh, sell unregistered securities. Uh, don't rely on the hap what's called the happy investor exemption, which <clears throat> you sometimes see that says, well, everybody made money, everybody's happy. So, you know, uh, all, all is well, um, it works, you know, it, it could work as, as, uh, as, as long as it does, but then, uh, if something does go wrong, um, again, you, you've got a problem and there could be civil and criminal penalties if you get things wrong. Uh, and as, as I said, there are many exemptions uh, to, for, uh, for raising money. So um, uh, marketing your, your opportunity to what are called accredit, accredited investors only is the safest way to go. Uh, and a, a accredited investor is an investor, either a person or, a, or an entity that meets certain uh, financial thresholds. So it's essentially, you know, people who are deemed to be, uh, to have enough money that they can fend for themselves. Um, so there, there are sort of income and asset uh, tests uh, for accredited investors. Also limiting the number of invest investors that you are um, getting money from is the safest. And going back to your private placement memo, um, when in doubt, uh, disclose. The, another big part of your private placement memo will be a discussion of the risks of your, of your business. Uh, and these are, oops, risk factors. Uh, what are the risks of investing in your business? And again, uh, disclose, disclose, disclose. Uh, what you, uh, again, what you don't want is somebody to invest in your business, something is wrong, and they say, oh, well, you never told me that could happen. You didn't tell me that your type of business is susceptible to a particular type of risk. Um, and this is sometime an area, sometimes an area where the lawyers and the client um, are, uh, you know, butt heads a little bit. Uh, it's, it's the lawyers always want to disclose more, and it's to the client's benefit to disclose more uh, even if it might show some warts in your business plan, um, uh, what you don't want to do is have those come back and bite you and it wasn't disclosed to the investor and then you've got, you've got a problem. So um, key takeaways, I think I'm, I'm at the end of my time just about uh, get things right from the start. It's easier to clean things up uh, or get things right from the start than it is to clean things up later. Identify why and what you need the money for decide the type of equity fundraising that you're looking for. Is it a bank loan? Uh, is it just using investing more of your own funds? Um, figure out what you have and what you need. Assemble your team of professionals, your um, uh, CFO or an outside uh, chief financial officer, your accounting, your accountants, tax advisors, bankers, attorneys. And once you have everything documented and ready to go, 
then you go pitch and um, and try to raise some money. So that's all I have. And uh, any, any questions? If your company is based um, primarily in like IP, how do you come up with an evaluation? What's the best way to come up with an evaluation? So for instance, film. Uh, for instance, uh, what's film. Film? Yeah. Oh, like, like a film idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, if, if you're, if, it's tricky. I mean, actually, I know that if you're, if you're looking to raise money for a film specifically, yes. yeah. uh, that's a bit of a world in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, where it, it's a little different from just, um, uh, you know, raising money, you know, for, for a company as a whole. But I do know for a film, uh, get people attached to it uh, when you can. So um, banks, uh, you know, banks and other companies specifically do loan money to, to for film productions. Uh, but they want to know, you know, who's your writer? Is there a track record? Do you have any, you know, actors that I know attached to it? Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, banks will lend against, uh, pre-sold foreign rights for a company where you can, you know, go to sell the idea of your company to, uh, or, uh, to, uh, distributors who say, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I will distribute your, your, your film once you make it. And then you can use that as collateral to go, uh, to go to a bank. So it's a tricky one. It's a bit of a, it's a little bit of, it's, if it's of its own world, um, but, um, but like anything, it would be valued in the context of what the business is. So if you have, you know, a big star attached and you have something else attached, uh, odds are that your, you know, your idea is more, more worthy of investment. So, um, uh, but I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that, but it's a bit of a unique um, kind of uh, area. Other questions? Oh, we got one back. No, it's so the online people can hear it. Yeah, make sure the lights. So my question is, if you currently have a business attorney and you don't really like the relationship between the two of you and don't feel like the person is serving you at your best interest, can you get a new attorney? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, you're, you're the client, uh, like any other, any other business. Uh, you can fire your lawyer if you don't like them. Uh, you can, uh, you know hire a new one absolutely happens all the time thank you yep i'd be happy to talk to you if you're looking for one <laughs> <laughs> anything else oh, we got a question over here for a small business that's um retail um, is it better to have an LLC out of Delaware or is it more advantageous to have it here in Arizona? Well, you know, that's a good question. A lot of uh, Delaware is a, a, a state for many historical reasons that a lot of companies are formed in. Uh, they have a very robust set of uh, case law for, for businesses. And, um, and they're also very, um, you don't have to disclose very much when you're forming your company. Arizona requires that you disclose more in terms of who owns it, uh, who's on your board, things like that. Um, the question about whether, whether to form your company in Delaware or Arizona, it doesn't really depend on whether you're a retail company or not. It's just sort of a general question. And uh, honestly, um, there's, if you're looking to uh, raise money down the road from investors, again, for historical reasons, oftentimes investors uh, prefer Delaware corporations simply because there is that history of how the how the corporate case law works. Uh, but in terms of just you know day to day operation, there really isn't much of a of a difference, frankly. Um, either way, if it, even if you form in Delaware, you're going to have to register your business to do business in Arizona. So you will have some disclosure in Arizona, one way or the other. Um, so uh, you know, unless there's a specific reason, there's nothing wrong with forming in Arizona. We have very good case law here as well. Uh, but again, if, if you're looking for uh, outside funding and from big investors, sometimes they want to see Delaware just, just because that's what they deal most often with. And they might not, especially if they're out of state investors, they might not be as familiar with Arizona, so they might look for it. But um, unless you're at that stage, I, I don't really see a particular benefit for doing it. And down the road, 
If you need to, you could switch. You could reincorporate your company in Delaware or just move it to Delaware. So um, um, there's no magic answer to it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. At this point, we're going to take a 10 minute break. So we will start back up at 1155. You can get up and stretch some water, get some coffee, finish off the bagel and the fruit. Um, network a little bit, but again, 11.05, we'll start back and we will have our friends with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona talking at that point. Going to uh, kick off this next section with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. We've got Catherine with us, so thank you. Again, forward and back, all right. and it's all yours. Can you guys hear me? All right. First of all, let me just say it is so nice to see you all here. Um, so I live on the west side of town, and I was driving in. The traffic was horrible, and I thought to myself, "Oh, you know what? No one was is going to be here." And to my surprise, uh, we have a room full of individuals, and it's so nice to see your beautiful faces. Um, I'm Catherine Matson, and I am uh, the new staff vice president for small group sales at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. I've been with the Blues a little over 25 years, and uh, my team. We work with employers that have less than 50 employees and um, we're responsible for both sales and service. So when it comes to benefits and health insurance, by a show of hands, tell me um, how many of you feel on a scale of one to 10 that you're an expert on health insurance and offering benefits? Like 10, I'm an expert, raise your hand. Okay, how about uh, a seven, a five, a four, four. Three, two, one. One? Okay. Well, that's, you know, don't fret. Um, we are here to actually make this really simple for all of you, even if you're somewhat new to offering benefits. Um, so I know that there are a lot of options available um, for businesses. Um, and there's so many different health insurance plans out there. So you have individual under 65 plans that are available for uh, individuals who aren't provided insurance through their employer. Um, you have uh, Medicare insurance that are available to individuals that are um, either disabled or over the age of 65. Uh, you have short-term medical, but today we're going to talk about group health insurance. Now, a group health insurance plan is an employer-sponsored health plan that provides health care coverage to um, businesses, uh, their employees, and the families of those employees. So um, in the group health insurance market, okay. You might be asking yourself the question, hey, I'm trying to start a business or I have a small business. Um, why should I offer health insurance? 
Well, the reason is um, for businesses that do offer benefits to their employees, it allows you to compete for that top talent. So as you're growing your business, you want to have good people around you and you want to attract people that are going to stay. You don't want to bring somebody in and then they leave, you know, the very next month or the next year because that actually costs you income. Um, and the reality is people are looking for more than just wages. You, if you look at an advertisement in the paper, um, you'll see we offer competitive salaries and benefits medical, dental, vision, life insurance. And believe it or not, um, as a hiring manager, we see it all the time. <laughs> you know, the very first question, surprisingly enough, is what does the benefits look like? Before they ask me, well, what's the salary for this position? So it is important to, um, to employees that they feel protected and um, that they know they have that peace of mind, that their emotional health, their physical health, um, and their mental health are all protected by their um, group health plan. And we all know that healthy employees are happier employers, employees and more productive. Um, and there is somewhat of a difference between a group health plan and an individual under 65 plan. Um, and what we are seeing in the Arizona market is that oftentimes a small group health insurance plan is gonna be more affordable than potentially an individual under 65 plan. So, um, in order to determine whether or not your business qualifies for group in health insurance, you have to ask yourself this one question. Uh, will I have at least one common law employee enrolling on the health plan? So, we need to have two eligible with that common law employee enrolling. Um, if you are an owner only, or if it's just the owner and the owner spouse enrolling on the group health plan, then you would not qualify. And we get that question a lot. So if you're a sole proprietor and you have no W-2 employees, or you have um, someone that is not an owner uh, uh, available to en enroll on the plan, then you would not be able to apply for a group health insurance. So again, if you take away anything from today's session, just remember, you need to have at least one common law employee enrolling in order to qualify. Um, now, there are several different types of plans available to groups in this two to 50 space. We have ACA fully insured plans, and the ACA stands for the Affordable Care Act. Now, the Affordable Care Act went into full effect in 2014, and these are the plans that are being sold across the country. We have partially self-funded plans, and you'll see these plans come in a variety of names. So Blue Cross, our partially self-funded plan is called Balanced Funding, but you may also hear it called Level Funding. Now, these particular plans are available to groups that are a little larger in size and promote a culture of wellness. And then we have association health plans that are industry specific. So just to take a little deeper dive here, um, when it comes to our ACA fully insured plan, some of the advantages are this is a guaranteed issue group health plan. So it doesn't matter what the health status is of you or any of your employees. It's guaranteed issue um, and it's pool rated. And what that means is everyone in that small group pool, they work together and their experience works together. And that's how the rates are calculated the following year. Um, Again, these plans are available to groups in that two to 50 size segment. There's no gender rating. That means men and women are charged the exact same rate depending on their age. And we do have some network and benefit flexibility on these plans. Now, some of the disadvantages are these products, because they are guaranteed issue, may not be the lowest price plan available to you. Um, we do have constraints in our plan designs because these are highly regulated by the federal government and the benefits can change every year because what happens on these plans is every year we have to take all of our benefit plan designs, we run them through an actuarial value calculator that C uh, the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services puts out. We have to make sure our benefits um, still fit within that particular product's metallic level benefit. So um, we also have the level funding available. Um, now these, I skipped, sorry. 
Yes. Uh, these products, they're um, available to groups that have at least nine or more enrolling through the end of 2022. Beginning in 2023, we're going to drop that number down to five. So you have to have at least five employees enrolling on this plan in order to qualify. Um, the nice thing about these products is that they can be super competitive. The rates can look really good on this type of product compared to some of our others. And um, there is a potential for an employer to earn some of their money back if the claims run better than expected. So when we're designing these plans and we're coming up with the pricing, we're going to project what we think the claims should come in based off of your group's demographics. But if you outperform, then you get Blue Cross gives back 100% of that surplus to the employer. So um, again, this particular product works well for groups and employers that really encourage their employees to live a healthy lifestyle because ultimately that can keep the claims down low and then you get some of your money back. Um, we have greater flexibility on these types of products because it's built on a self-funded platform and there is gender rating. Um, and what that means is you may see if you have a group of construction workers and they're mostly you know, 21 to 25 years old, those rates are probably going to look better on a level funding plan versus an ACA product. Some of the disadvantages are, again, you have to have that minimum number of employees enrolling. If you have less than 15 employees enrolling on this plan, we do require individual medical questionnaires. So it's a really simple form that every employee has to fill out. And we ask some basic questions so that we can provide that to our underwriters and then they can come up with the best rate possible for your particular group. Now, the drawback to this product is that you can get declined for coverage um, because the overall health status of the group is factored into this plan. Um, we have association health plans. Now these are plans that were designed for specific industries. So if you are in the manufacturing industry or auto worker or construction, or if you're a part of the Arizona Tech Council, all of these industries offer a very unique plan design to their members. Um, you can have as little as two employees to, to qualify for this product, but some of the disadvantages are you can be declined because health status is taken into consideration. Um, this product is managed by a, a third party um, benefit administrator, so there's um, sometimes a little bit of a higher fee to manage this product, and um, in order to qualify, you have to be a member of the association that's offering the plan. So for example, um, the Arizona um, physicians, they have a product, but they have to be a part of the um, Arizona uh, Association of, of Providers. Okay. So no matter what, what plan um, you're purchasing, there are some key terms you need to know. So the first is premium. Now the premium, this is the money that you pay the insurance company to have the health insurance plan. Then we have deductibles. Now this is um, the amount that you would pay for major services, like for inpatient service or outpatient services. So you're gonna pay your deductible before the health insurance company um, participates in that claim. Then we have copays. Now, copay is a small cost share amount. This is so when you go to the doctor and you have a $25 copay in order to see that provider. Or if you go to see a specialist, you may pay $50 to see the specialist. But it's a set fee and it's incurred anytime you utilize services um, for like labs or you know, PCPs, specialists, et cetera. Um, Coinsurance. Uh, now, this is the cost share between the insurance company and the insured, and it goes into effect after the deductible is met. So, if you had a plan that had 100% coinsurance, that means once you meet your deductible, you're covered at 100%. If you had a um, health insurance plan that had an 80 20 coinsurance, that means once your deductible is met, the insurance company is going to pay 80% of that claim, you would be responsible for 20% up until your maximum out-of-pocket expense 
um, is met. So whenever you hear OOP or max out of pocket, this is the amount, this is the, um, this is the greatest amount of money that you would pay out of pocket uh, within a plan year before the insurance company picks up 100% of your claims, okay? Um, so another question you'd have to answer to is, well, what type of product are you looking for? Are you looking for a PPO or are you looking for an HMO? Um, I recently hired someone and he's, he's kind of young and um, brand new to this industry. And so we were kind of going over some of these general terms and I said, okay, well, we have PPOs and HMOs. He goes, I do know one thing, PPOs are the best. I'm like, well, you know, it's really, it's relative. It just depends on what you're looking for. So a PPO stands for a preferred provider organization. Um, the nice thing about a PPO, it offers in and out of network coverage. Um, you do not have to go to your PCP in order to see a specialist. So there's no specialist referrals required. You usually get a wide range of providers that you can choose from. And you have coverage both in and out of state. So on the HMO side, um, the biggest thing with the HMOs is that you must, you must stay in network in order to have your claim covered unless it's an emergency, emergency situation. Some people like HMOs because it does offer that PCP coordinated care model where you go to your PCP, you share with them kind of what your overall health issues are, and they will guide you through the healthcare system, which can be quite complex. Um, so really, again, it just depends on what you're looking for. So we have PPOs and HMOs, and then the next question that you'd have to answer is, well, what type of plan do I wanna offer my employees? Do I want a traditional copay plan where employees will just pay a small copay for everyday services? Um, again, that deductible is gonna to apply to inpatient and outpatient services. Or do I want a high deductible health plan um, where everything is subject to the deductible before you go into coinsurance, except for preventative services? A lot of people, they shy away from high deductible health plans because they get a little nervous and they'll say, oh, I have a $5,000 deductible before my health insurance picks up anything. Like what kind of coverage is this? I'm only saying that because my husband had the, a copay plan with the city of Phoenix for forever. He retired after 25 years. And then I put him on the HSA, high deductible health plan. And we had a good two hour conversation on why this was a better plan, but. The nice thing about a high deductible health plan is that it can be paired with an HSA, which is a health savings account. Now, the high deductible health plan is managed by the health insurance company. If you want to pair it with an HSA, you have to go to a bank or a banking institution and they'll set up the health savings account portion for you. Now, the nice thing about the HSA is that all your contributions are tax deductible. The money that grows within that account, when you take it out, it's tax-free. And as an employer, you can contribute to your employee's HSA. As an employee, if I decide to leave my employer, I take my HSA with me. And it's the only uh, financial tool out there that is structured in this way. So when you leave your employer, actually, that is your account. You take it with you to your next employer, or if you're starting your own business, those funds are still set aside for um, qualified medical expenses. Another thing about an HSA is that you can use it for more than just medical. If you're going in to see your dentist, you can use your funds out of your HSA to pay for that dental appointment. You can use it for eyeglasses or contacts. Um, so as you can see, I'm a big believer in the HSA, um, primarily is because we are low utilizers. Um, of healthcare. You know, we go in for preventative, but other than that, knock on wood, everything is, you know, pretty good. Um, so every year that you contribute into your HSA, that money rolls over year after year. Um, as a family, we you can contribute up to $7,500 into your HSA. As an individual, I believe it's $3,500. So if you're saving, you know, $3,500 for 10 years, I mean, that's 
thirty-five thousand dollars is that that you could spend on healthcare, and if you, your high deductible health plan is set at a five thousand dollar deductible, your deductible is already covered in the event you may have a major medical issue. So, um, if you want to learn more about this, definitely see me afterwards. I'm happy to talk to you a little bit more about it. Um, so, after you decide on your plan, then you have to decide on the network. Uh, the network is a critical component of health insurance. And the reason I say that is because if you're an HMO, you have to stay within the network. Otherwise, your claim is not going to be covered. If you're on a PPO, if you go within, if you stay within your network, then your cost share is going to be um, low. If you go out of network, you're going to have to pay more out of pocket for those services. So again, it's critically important as you're looking for a health insurance plan to check that carrier's website and make sure your provider is in the network. Um, so you can uh, look at broad network options. You can look at narrow network options. If it's a narrow network, this just means there's gonna be a trade-off. While you may not have access to as many providers, you will see um, a more affordable price point on those narrow network options. So at Blue Cross, we have our Alliance Network. It's anchored by Banner Health and Honor Health. And then in Southern Arizona, we have Pima Connect that's anchored by um, TMC and Northwest Hospitals. So now you know your plan and your network. Um, the next question you guys must be asking yourself is, well, how much is this gonna cost me? I mean, that is usually the million dollar question. How much is it gonna cost? And the reality is the price is going to be different for every employer. And the reason for that is the rates are based off of each employer's specific demographics. So in order for us to generate a quote for you, we need your employee demographics. And it's really easy to get this information. You just complete a census, tell us who's going to be covered on the, under the plan, their date of birth and their zip code, and we can generate a quote for you. Um, once you get the quote back, then the next step would be to select the plans and networks that you wanna to offer to your employees. You want to determine your contribution approach. And this is important because depending on how you structure your contribution, meaning how much are you, of your employees premiums are you gonna cover, it will drive participation. So we've seen some employers, they'll say, okay, I'm gonna pick this plan and I'm gonna pay 100% of the employee premium. And if they wanna add their dependents, then they would pick up the additional charges. We've seen other businesses that are, um, you know, maybe just starting out and they'll only pay 50% of their employee premium. So that contribution approach really is important because you need to have at least 70% of your employees who are eligible for the health plan to enroll on the health plan. Um, uh, once you determine your contribution approach, you're gonna schedule your open enrollment meeting and you get all your employees to sign up for their health plans and then just complete the new group paperwork. It's very easy. We, all we ask for is an employer application. We um, ask a couple of questions in regards to your group size. That just um, helps us ensure that we're offering you the correct plan. If you have less than nine eligible employees, we do ask for a wage and tax. And then we would need um, either the paper employee applications to go with that employer app, or we could take an eligibility census. As I mentioned before, benefits is, is more than just health insurance, a medical health insurance. Um, if you're looking to build a comprehensive benefits package for your employees, you may want to consider adding dental or life insurance or disability or vision. Um, so there's a whole suite of products that we can help you uh, with when you're trying to design that comprehensive offering. And just to wrap it up, um, again, in order to uh, um, in order for us to offer you a health insurance plan, you have to have at least 70% of your eligible employees enrolling on the plan. Uh, we do require employers to contribute at least 50% towards that employee only premium. Now there is an exception to this, and that is 
during the small group open enrollment window, which runs from November 15th through December 15th for a January 1st effective date, all participation and contribution requirements are waived. So this is the small group open enrollment window where as a small employer, you would not have to contribute towards your employee's premium and we do not um, hold you to the 70% participation. Again, that's only from November 15th through December 15th for January 1st effective date. Um, it's also important to note that discrimination is not permitted. As an employer, you need to be clear on who's eligible for your health plan. And um, the continuation of coverage, COBRA, um, as well as many COBRA laws do apply here in the state of Arizona. And COBRA is if you have an employee that terminates off of your health plan, you have to allow them to continue their health coverage until they find another, um, uh, until they find a new employment or they obtain coverage some other way. Um, the only thing to note here is that once an employee goes onto COBRA, then they're responsible for the full premium. You no longer have to contribute towards their premium when they're on COBRA. Okay, um, are there any questions? Okay, go ahead. So you spoke about HMO plans as well as the um, PPO plans. Do you, does uh, Blue Cross have the POS plans, the point of point of sale? sale ones, yeah. We don't have point of sale. Um, a point of sale plan is similar to an HMO. It drives individuals into a very specific network of doctors. And if you go to one of those doctors, it's going to be a lower cost share. Um, and if you go outside of that specific group of doctors, and then it's just going to be higher um, cost share. So um, again, with the POS plan, I believe you go out of network, it's not covered, correct? Um, I think it is, but I, I know they said it's kind of a hybrid of the two. So yeah, that's what I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, it's a hybrid because you, it, you, know, you have a larger network of doctors to choose from. But if you go to like these very specific, it's like a network within a network, these very specific doctors, it's usually lower cost share. And then if you're like, hey, I, these are not the doctors I wanna go to, you still have access to a larger network, but you do have to stay in network on those POS plans. Is it, uh, I have a question, is it more cost advantageous for a business to go through a PP or PEO to get their healthcare or go directly to? It's not really cost advantage because it's the same plan. So usually with the PEO, you're utilizing more services than just the health insurance. So usually they offer payroll services or something else. And they say, okay, in addition to the payroll services, we can put you on to a health plan. Um, but, you know, we, we have it both ways. I and mean, when we have uh, PEO agreements and arrangements in place for small businesses, that, that's a good fit for them. Um, but if that's not a good fit for you, we have other options as well. It's really, um, I think as a small employer, I, I would recommend um, working with a consultant or with a broker because they can help you find the plan that's gonna be best for you, whether that's a PEO or level funding or an ACA plan or an association of health plan. Um, they can help you decide whether you wanna go down the POS plan uh, route or HMO or PPO. So um, yeah, I would, we have so many great brokers here in the state of Arizona and consultants and they work day in and day out for small businesses um, to really help you um, you know, make that good decision for your employees. For those that don't know, PEO is a professional employment organization. Um, it's kind of a, it's a complicated thing, but for some businesses, it's actually a very good right. program to connect with. Yeah. And um, I think Blue Cross has a program with CPR, which is a local PEO here in, in the state of Arizona. We do have some questions from online. Oh, okay. Um, the first of which being, where do we find a list of small business associations that offer healthcare plans or coverage? We have um, information on azblue.com, but I'm also happy to um, send that information directly. To, I can send it to you, Robert, and then you can get it out to the team. 
Uh, that way they can have the flyer and everything at their fingertips. Excellent. Um, and then a second question, and this again might be a little specific, so if we need to follow up, we can. Um, but Jason shares a question on a group health plan. I was informed that if your company was formed as an S Corp, as long as the spouse was a part of payroll, they would be eligible for group coverage. The spouse is eligible, but they have to have at least one common law employee also enrolling. So if it's just the spouse and the owner, I'm sorry, if it's the owner and the owner's spouse, if they're the only ones enrolling in the plan, then they would not be eligible for a group health insurance plan. But if they had you know, a W-2 employee, like an assistant or um, coordinator or someone else that is not an owner and they enroll in the plan, then yes, we could offer to the S Corp. Excellent, thank you. Okay, thank you guys. All right, just a reminder, um, I know some people may have to take off, please, for those in person, please get with Cheryl in the back. Cheryl, raise your hand uh, with blue or with business journals. I mean, Cindy, sorry, Mother C. Cindy, we'll get your business card because one of the things for being in person was getting a uh, nice little perk in the Phoenix Business Journal, 75 words. So make sure your business card is with Cindy so she can get that taken care of and follow up with you on that. And then uh, we're gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Nancy Sanders from the Small Business Development Center. Uh, they are a great partner of ours um, and the Arizona network is awesome. So uh, Nancy, it's all yours. Explain this to me. This is forward and that's back, and I will load up your presentation right now. Okay, and do I need to hold this? Nope. No. Okay. Should pick up. Okay. So this is always a great time because there's a downside to being the last person, and there's an upside. The downside is that is anyone's stomach growling? Is it time for lunch for anyone? Okay, but the good part is that I've gotten to hear about all these great resources and I've made some notes. So hopefully what I share with you today is um, even more meaningful for, um, for, for the future. As Bob said, I'm Nancy Sanders. I'm the interim associate state director for America's SBDC in Arizona, which means that I oversee the outreach and the partnership development for our entire state. And how many of you know about the SBDC? So a few, okay. So the Small Business Development Center is um, part of the Small Business Administration, SBA. And so we receive funding from SBA. And then in Arizona, we are hosted by Maricopa Community Colleges District. So we get funding from them, from those two entities. And then we enjoy a very, special partnership with the Arizona Commerce Authority. So you're gonna hear a little bit about that. So because of that, all that support that those organizations provide, our services are for the most part free. Our counseling is really the heart of what we do and there is no fee for that, that counseling, that one-on-one. -on -one. So everyone today talked about the importance of having that uh, group of advisors you know, a bookkeeper, an accounting professional, legal advice, definitely insurance and, and financing. Well, we're one of those people that you should think about as a resource. Uh, so we have 10 centers. We cover the entire state and we have um, experts in certain industries. So for instance, one of the speakers today talked about the importance of protecting your inter, inter, it, I'm sorry, intellectual property. I guess I'm hungry now too. Uh, so, you know, we have experts that are helping businesses commercialize technology. We have experts in um, people who, in helping people who are starting businesses as well as people who are growing your business. And what we ask of our clients is that they tell us when they're successful. OK, so we don't charge a fee necessarily, but your the cost of the service is that you tell us when you're growing your business. So there are several things that we track. I know you can't probably see this, but we track the number of clients that we've served. 
We track the number of new jobs that those businesses have, have started, the number of jobs that those businesses ha have retained as a consequence of working with our network, the revenue increase, which I think everybody here probably wants to increase their revenue. And then the number one most important goal is capital formation. So for the calendar year of 2021, we helped our clients um, with more than 140 million in capital formation. Now, what does that mean? So for our purposes, it's debt or equity. So you had two speakers today who talked about primarily equity and, and debt. So, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about Wells Fargo and when I talk about a program that, that we're offering. So we track these numbers and then we share those numbers with our partners or communities. So if you're interested in more information about um, the types of businesses we work with or um, where the nearest center is um, to provide service to you or your clients, we're happy to do that too. So how do we help small businesses grow? Well, there's a number of things we do. Uh, we have a small business growth program, which is um, helping businesses either start or grow or transition to something else. We have a statewide money team. So those people are primarily the people that if you need funding for your business and you're going the debt route, so you're thinking about, I'm going to take out um, a loan for to buy a building or to get some working capital. So we have people around the state that um, can help you find the equivalent of Tim and his team around the state and other lenders too, not just Wells Fargo. We have an Aero pilot program, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Aero stands for Advancing Entrepreneurs Ready for Opportunities. And um, that program has been funded by, Wells, by a grant through Wells Fargo. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about that. And then the bulk of what we do, I would say, is working with clients every day on how do they plan for the future? How do they get prepared for what's next for their business? And they're in the best position to access the resources that you've heard about today. So because we're talking about the end of the year, how may, or I mean, does it, isn't it unbelievable that it's already November? Is anybody like surprised that the calendar says November? So I'm, I'm doing, we do an external newsletter for people who are um, not our clients necessarily. So if you're interested in, in receiving that, then please let me know. And one of the things that I'm putting together is the information that, uh, that we've, you know, how we've worked with clients in the past year. So I say, well, people either love this time of year or they hate it, right? You're either really excited about what you've accomplished or you're thinking, gosh, I didn't quite you know, hit my goals. Um, you might be thinking about you know, what resources do you need for the future, et cetera. So one of the things I'm gonna, I hope you remember three things from the discussion today. And one is the most important thing for you to do between now and the end of the year, and I would say even mid-December, because if you go any farther than that, you'll forget about it, is what did you accomplish? What are you really proud of in 2022? So perhaps you got your financials in order for the first time. You hired an accounting professional to help you with that. Perhaps you launched a new marketing campaign. Uh, maybe you uh, got a big client uh, that you hadn't worked with before. So it's important that you acknowledge the accomplishments that you've had, right? Because that as entrepreneurs and small business owners, that kind of keeps us going to feel like we're moving forward and making progress. It's also important that you plan for 2023. So how many of you have a 2023 plan right now? Oh, this is so exciting. This is great. So I'm going to encourage you again between now and December 15th to really think about what is it that you want to accomplish in 2023. And what I tell business owners when I counsel business owners 
and what I tell my team in their performance evaluation uh, process is that it's important to have those business and professional goals, but it's also important to have those personal goals because you want, as business owners, you want to make sure that you don't have competing priorities or that you think about what's important. You know, Catherine talked about health insurance. So how, and she said her family is, you know, in, in good shape. So do, are you in good shape health-wise? Is that something that you want to work on in 2023? So I say no more than three because really you can't focus on more than three. Now, probably um, I already told you what we measure. So you already know that our goals as a network, we have more than three goals. I'm guessing Tim Wells Fargo has more than three goals in 2023, right? But that defeats the purpose. You really can't concentrate on more than three things at a time. So what are those things that you wanna accomplish in 2023? Well, we talked about today, maybe you have a new product or service that you're going to, to launch. Do you want to increase profitability? Are you planning to expand? What, you know, what is it that you want to accomplish? And then this is the important part, which is really what today is all about. What are those resources that you need to make those things happen? When I was a small business owner, I did not understand commercial lending. I really wish I would have understood that at that point because my businesses would have been much more successful. And when I sold my businesses, I could have sold them for more money also. So what is it that you, where do you need help? And while the presenters that you heard today have a specialization, they also know people in lots of different areas and industries. And Bob and Faith would be a great resource for you also to identify what is it, who can help me and how do I, how do I reach out? So you've got these goals. Let's assume you've got these goals. They probably fall into something related to either starting your business, growing your business, or I'm going to talk about Arrow, which is a pilot match program. This is a way for you to get the resources from fledgling small businesses or student entrepreneurs or students who are thinking about starting a business to get some resources for you to put some plans in place. So we talked about um, you know, a marketing campaign. Maybe you think that social media is uh, going to be helpful to you in outreach, or maybe you need a marketing campaign. You need want to know, has the website, is it optimized for dealing with those, um, with those opportunities that come along? So the idea behind Arrow is that Wells Fargo came to Maricopa Community College's foundation and said, we want to support small business in entrepreneurship in Arizona. And the foundation, which is all about scholarships for students, said to Wells Fargo, let's fund, let's use the money for scholarships. And Wells Fargo said, no, because student debt is a real issue. We want to do something that's more direct, more hands-on. So we came up with this idea of making this match program, if you will. And so everybody who hears about this program thinks it's a great idea. It's really in the pilot stage right now. And the bulk of the people that we're working with, small business providers and seekers, as we call them, are in Maricopa County. But if you're not in Maricopa County, don't let that um, keep you from uh, exploring because we have clients all over the state. We served almost 4,000 clients last year. So we have somebody that can help you um, regardless of where you are. So the idea behind this is that you either are a provider of services um, or you're seeking services. So um, as I said, you're wanting to put together a social media campaign. You know, that is a great job for a student entrepreneur, right? Because don't you think that probably college students know as much or more than you do about social media. Um, you know, how many of you have TikTok? Use TikTok, okay? A couple of you. 
Well, think about how many of you have a target of people who are 35 and under. If you have a target, if that's your target, then you need to consider being on TikTok because that's the number one social media platform for people of that age. Now, I'll admit to you, we do not have a TikTok. And we need to be more intentional about working with younger entrepreneurs. So that's one thing that we're going to start in 2023 is we are going to have a TikTok. So Catherine, you can hold me to that, you know, um, and I'll be checking out, you know, your organizations on TikTok too. So you register again, um, as I said, this is funded by a grant from Wells Fargo and the money is used, was used to outreach to help tell people about the program. And it was used for scholarships, about a third of the money for scholarships. So if you have um, students in your family or in your life who are interested in pursuing a degree or a certificate in small business or entrepreneurship, they might be able to get scholarships for those programs at Maricopa Community Colleges. So I don't usually talk about the scholarships because I'm the small business assistance area, but think about that. We have given, we have, I shouldn't say given, we have awarded a very small amount of the money that's been allocated for the stipends, for the, the arrow matchmaking and the scholarships. So there's a lot of money out there. And, you know, I'm sure Tim would say that they want to make sure that we're maximizing the funds that we get. So we want to work with as many people as we can to help that program be successful. So what does that look like if you're interested in learning more? So we have a, we're directing everybody to our maricopa.edu slash growth uh, page because that talks about, are you interested in starting? Are you interested in, in growing? Are you interested in a match? We also have a website, obviously, um, which is azsbdc.net but we're in the process of transitioning to a new website, a new and improved website. And so um, we're directing people here uh, because that, that gives you information on all of those things. If you are a small business owner, then we meet with people by appointment. We, as I was talking yesterday to a center director, probably every, well, maybe not at this point in time, but as um, Catherine said, hey, it's great to be in places. It's great to stand up in front of people and not just on the screen, not just on the little screen, but it's great to meet people in person, right? So it's most helpful if we meet in person sometimes because we get to see your operation. Uh, you can tell us about, you know, show us your product, but we offer virtual appointments as well. And all of our counseling is by appointment only. And so a couple of tools, and I only, I usually don't go into very much detail about our tools. However, it's important to talk about some of these tools now, in particular because of the information that was shared um, by some of the presenters today. So you want to be in the best position to grow your business. And so that you need, you probably need or want access to data that you don't know where to go to get it. You may not even know what data you need or what data is available. So we have some tools to help um, access that data. And a new tool that we are using is, is something called Vertical IQ. And Vertical IQ is a platform that actually lenders use. I'm not, I'm not saying Wells Fargo uses it or Prestamos, that part I don't know. But lenders use this tool to help make assessments or determinations about about loans. So that helps us provide updated information to our clients about, hey, what is profitability for your type of company? What's a good, helps you determine what should be my marketing budget? You know, what's the average profitability for a business of my size? So that's one of the, the tools that we use. We also have a, um, a profitability tool, which is called ProfitSense, which comes from SageWork. Um, we also have um, Ibis World as another platform providing business intelligence. And there was something else I was going to share. Oh, um, we also have um, a, a platform that we have access to called Growth Wheel, which has a lot of 
um, information and worksheets on various topics related to business. So if you want to say, hey, I want to work on my marketing plan, but what's in a marketing plan? There's a worksheet for that. Or I want to share some information. I want to learn something about what is in a successful marketing plan. Well, there's, there's resources for that. There's articles on that. Life plan. Life plan. Thank you. That's what I was trying to think of. Isn't it great when the people that you work with know your stuff better than you do? So Live Plan is an online business planning tool. And what's really cool about Live Plan is that you can have, you can maintain this, your plan, your access um, indefinitely for a very small fee. But to start out, if you're an SBDC client and it's appropriate for you to have a business plan, then there's, there's no fee for that. And we'll work with you to um, get you to the point where you're either have your plan to go to the bank or you have the plan that you need. And the beauty of Live Plan is that not only can you provide, not only do you have access to that as the business owner or other people that you work with in your business, but the counselor has access to your plan also. So you do a little, you go in there, you do a little work online, and then your counselor gets a notification that you went in there and changed something. And then your counselor goes in, makes comments or, or forms a list of questions that they're gonna ask you at your next, next appointment. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> so that's just a little bit of information. I could, we could probably go on and on and on for hours about how um, our success stories, our client success stories, um, you know, how we have worked with clients and how we have helped them identify the resources that are available because we don't do it all. Like Gabe and I were talking, you know, Prestamos doesn't work with everybody. Wells Fargo doesn't work with everybody. You know, Catherine talked about, you know, here's kind of their niche for Blue Cross Blue Shield. So we don't have all the answers, but we have resource partners. Um, you know, we, we share information with ACA about programs they offer, um, chambers frequently. So that's kind of how I'd like you to think of us as your go-to resource to grow your small business. How are we doing? You're right on time. Okay. Any questions? Oh, and I do have some, I don't have, I don't have the cool stuff out there. I don't have the great stuff that Blue Cross Blue Shield has, and I don't have horses, but I do have um, business cards and brochures out on the table. So thank you very much, Bob. All right, what questions do we have for Nancy? We do have one question online that we can jump to first. Um, so Nancy, I think you truly made people believers of the Small Business Development Centers, so much so um, that in the chat, we were asked to identify where they could find job postings if they are interested in working for the development centers. Well, that's, that's great because obviously we always, you know, we want to look for new people all. I mean, we want to have, have good people to provide this assistance. So if they're in Maricopa County um, or in Metro Phoenix area, I should say, um, if you're looking at a, a position in Maricopa County, SBDC, then you would go to our host's website, which is maricopa.edu. I think it's slash jobs and you can do a search for jobs there. The other thing um, that you can do if you're interested in, uh, you'll send um, or provide my email address. Um, if you reach out to me and let me know what area you might, if you're in a different geographical area, reach out to me, I'd be happy to connect you with the center director in that community. So thanks, Faith. Excellent, thanks, Nancy. And I just saw a little chat pop up about where to call. Nancy's phone number is on the screen. You can call her and then she'll guide you to where you need to for an appointment um, to get set up there. Um, I want to wrap up here. We had a great session. We had a great presenters. And I want to kind of wrap up with a little analogy or a little story. Um, one of the things that we heard early on today was that you want to build your team. And we know that when you're starting a business, you guys hear me okay if it's down there? When you're starting a business, it's hard. You're really good at what you're passionate about. That's why you're starting it. But there's so many other things you have to be aware of and you need that help. You need to build that team. So I'm going to liken it to a totally different way, but tie it back together. 
number of years ago, my wife and her friend got this harebrained idea that they wanted to do the swim from Alcatraz to San Francisco. Um, one of those bucket list things. Now it's like a two mile swim uh, in where you can do it at. And my wife hates swimming. <laughs> but she is into fitness. So, you know, they're passionate about their bucket list stuff. So what did they do? They went out and found a swim coach and they had personal trainers for other aspects. And so they, they built the team to help them prepare for this this activity and they did it with a bunch of other people, but they prepared over time. And again, they assembled that team and they were successful. Um, they both made it across, didn't get eaten by sharks or run over by boats or whatnot. Um, and I, I was on the boat and watched them swim. <laughs> but with your business, you got to assemble that team. You might be thinking, oh, I can do it myself. I don't need help. You need help. You need to get that team. You need someone to say, you know what, you might try that differently. Or you need someone that might tell you, no, not, not the best way to do it. Um, but it give you those options um, to guide you through different things. Sometimes your accountant can do that or your bookkeeper. But I would encourage everyone here that if you're not a client of SCORE, which was mentioned earlier, or the SBDC, or you might be with the Women's Business Center in Phoenix or in Tucson, um, or some of the other programs that are out there, be part of them, get that piece there, and then work with your business bankers we talked about. If you don't know who they are, find the, the one that's at your banking location. Whether they can do the business loan for you or not, you still wanna be connected with them. Um, and if you have a bookkeeper or someone that's helping you with books, you wanna be friendly there, or at least your accountant or your tax preparer. So you can have that team assembled to help, because they're invested in your success as well. Um, you know, if you're paying a bookkeeper, they, they want you to keep paying them, right? So they want you to be successful. You know, your lender, if they loan you money for your business, they want to help you be successful because they want to get that loan paid off. Everybody is invested in the success of your business. And so as you assemble that team, you have people on your side to help you out. So we hope that today was beneficial. The idea was to help understand the team and understand those things you need to as you're looking to grow. Um, this series has been more about helping the businesses that are existing look at growth plans in the future, but it also applies to new businesses that are just starting about getting everything together. Um, so thank you for being here. We appreciate all those in attendance. All, again, all those in attendance, make sure you get with Cindy, get her your business card so you can take advantage of that in-person uh, promotion that the Phoenix Business Journal put together. We're grateful all, for all of our partners, Phoenix Business Journal, SBDC, Gallagher and Kennedy, REDW, Wells Fargo, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Arizona. Uh, we couldn't do this without, the, without them and their help and their support. They're the experts. Um, so that's why we get them to present. So you don't have to listen to me over for three hours. Uh, we get some break there. I also want to recognize Faith. You may have seen emails from Faith Ritchie on my team. Couldn't do this without her as well. To give her a round of applause. And so with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Where, again, we can still network for a while. We're not in a hurry to, to vacate the room, but... Uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to any of us that are here and we're glad to answer those. So thank you.